Hey everyone, welcome to Growing With Fishes podcast. We do this podcast every week to help promote aquaponic cannabis growing as well as aquaponic growing uh, and cannabis related issues. Um, this week we have uh, Old Fart Grows. Uh, they've been with us once before and he's here to talk to us about extracts and um, edible, some home edible recipes and a couple of other cool things. Um, we also have uh, Fish Ganj Guy and Marty and Roger as always. Um, thanks to everyone for joining us. You're welcome. Yeah, glad to be here. Glad to be here, sir. Thanks for the invite. Hello, hello. And, glad uh, to be here. Yeah. Um, thanks for everybody. Um, just a reminder, uh, Marty and I will be teaching the aquaponic cannabis class this weekend, uh, on both online and at Ouroboro, in person at Ouroboros Farms. Uh, if you're interested, check out uh, ouroborosfarms.com for the cannabis class and then or uh, check out uh, Potent Ponics in the, under the shop section for the online class, depending on whether or not you're in the Bay Area. Um, it is located in Half Moon Bay, California, uh, just outside of San Francisco, about 30 minutes. Uh, be sure to check it out if you are interested in Saturday the 19th and Sunday the 20th. Alrighty. I'll be there. <laughs> yeah, he'll be there. Uh, alrighty, um, uh, uh, thanks for joining us again. Uh, um, what do you guys want me to call you on, on here? Uh, uh, I guess we have... Uh, yeah, anything. Okay, uh, so we have uh, Tommy and Dorian from Old Fart Grows, the the dynamic duo, and uh, um, uh, they're here to talk to us about uh, all different kinds of extracts, the upsides and downsides of different stuff, and kind of why the the first thought they they brought up a really cool topic to me the other day about how how uh, a lot of the butane and CO two stuff out there is is really toxic to the um, you know to the people that are taking it in, and how there's a lot of unaddressed things, uh, and they want to talk a little bit about that, and then they want they were going to talk to us a little bit about you know some some easy ways to make some some home edibles and, uh, and stuff like that to uh, do at home. So thanks a lot for joining us today, guys. Hey, thanks for the invite. We're well, you know how passionate we are about having good quality medicine and stuff, and some of our familiarity with uh, the different extract methods. Uh, it's kind of scary what's considered standard practice. Uh, and a lot of people are using, you know, butane for BHOs. That seems to be about the most popular. And then the second most popular behind that seems to be the carbon dioxide. And uh, without getting excessively technical, I'll talk about a little of the carbon dioxide, uh, why you might not want to use it. And then D is very familiar uh, with the problems with the closed loop systems and using pumps. And I maybe he'll pick up the ball after that. And if you have any questions about any of those things, Groovy, and then uh, I guess uh, we could then, you know, go on to alternatives. And so something uh, that's pre happening pretty often in the industry is uh, a lot of people are going to this CO2 extraction. And there's a lot of buzzwords that sound absolutely awesome when you talk about CO2. Hey, it's CO2. How, you know, how bad can it be? Well, just a sec. Is anyone else experiencing uh, Tommy breaking up a bunch? No, seems good here. No, it's just me. No, I'm, okay. I'm, He's breaking I'm, up a bunch for me. I just want to make sure it's not for everyone. Okay, thanks. Okay. So, uh, with the CO2, it sounds great, like, you know, carbon dioxide's in the atmosphere, it's not going to kill you, our plants love it, and everything like that. And first and foremost, it's not hydrocarbons, you know, it's not going to blow up. Well, yes and no. The pressures that you're dealing with for CO2 uh, can be up to 10,000 pounds per square inch. And when you're dealing with those kinds of pressures, you damn skippy better be good. Uh, one of the things that I see kind of happens around the cannabis industry is sometimes people have a process going and they stop to have a dab or they stop to do a bong and, oh, we're 15 minutes over on this or the other thing. And, and that can really cause problems. Uh, as if the problem with the CO2 doing a relatively poor job, I mean, there are things that do worse, but relatively it does a poor job of getting you cup winning extracts and and that's because co2 doesn't have a real liquid state and so it goes from a solid 
sublimates, so it turns directly from a solid into a gas. What you need for high quality extraction is the molecules of your whatever you're extracting really, really close together in a liquid form. So what they do is they pump up the pressures and change some of the temperatures to force uh, CO2 to become what's called supercritical, which is basically it's becoming a liquid. And the problems are it's so hard to control the temperatures uh, and, it, and, and in no time you can wind up having CO2 be either polar or nonpolar. And basically what polar or nonpolar means is think of like a magnet. And if some of the things that you want in your plant are magnetic, you would use a polar solvent. And if some of the things you wanted to get out of the plant were non-magnetic, you would use a non-magnetic solvent. So that's just a really loose way to kind of think of the polar stuff. Well, the CO2 is just ridiculously hard to control which is why if you've had BHO extracts or if you've had cold press extracts, uh, you, you just kind of find that, yes, the THC is high in a CO2 extract, but it just doesn't have the taste. It's, it'll get the job done. It's just not going to be that, oh, my goodness, isn't that delicate? Oh, I can taste you know, the, the, the good growing process in there. And the biggest problem with the CO2 when people are thinking in terms of, well, it's not poison, well, yes, it is. Um, if you take butane, BHO, which is one of the most common extractors, you know, people will do it with the blasting cans with all the oils in it. They'll do it with a purified butane or anything like that. If you have leakage out of the system, you know, I mean, think like anal leakage. That's always bad when your medicine, you know, has the disclaimer, oh, may cause anal leakage. This is much worse. 6% concentration in the air of butane is going to screw up your whole day because anything that sparks is going to blow you out of the lab. 4% concentration in the atmosphere of carbon dioxide, you're not getting out of the lab. And so it's actually quite dangerous. And when you're doing CO2s to finish the process and stuff, you actually want to need to use some of the flammable solvents and stuff to really get things done right. So you've just increased your expense You've put things at up to 10,000 pounds pressure, which can blow your freaking head off. Or if something's just leaking out of a part of the equipment and you put your hand past it like a steam pipe, putting out uh, a high pressure steam, you, you can sever things. So it, it's really super crazy dangerous and you don't honestly gain anything in quality and you don't uh, gain anything in safety. And uh, so and you lose in inconsistency. You lose in consistency compared yes. to other oh, yeah. systems. It's so hard to control it. And there, there are methods, uh, and we'll eventually go into like methods you can do at home. But if you're looking into the uh, industry, it might behoove you to, to learn other ways of, of getting your extracts that are safer uh, than that. And I'd like to kick it off to D and let him talk about uh, the two different styles of uh, extracting, let's say you're using a, uh, some kind of solvent like a butane or something, there's passive extraction uh, techniques, and then there's uh, closed loop uh, active extraction with pumps. And if we can all get together, and if we find somebody who's using the pumps, just beat the snot out of them and let them know some of the information deal share, I think everybody's gonna be safer everybody's going to get better meds in the end. And uh, so, Dee, you want to pick up on the uh, pumps and the differences between the passive and uh, active stuff? Certainly. Um, well, first off, one of the uh, benefits to having a passive um, butane extraction is you're only running the, um, the butane through the plant material once. And what that lets you do is dial in how much butane you need, how long it'll take, how long to put it through the uh, column. Uh, column. And uh, if you're using a, a pump system, a, a closed loop, running the butane through the plant material multiple times, you'll <coughs> most likely not only be pulling out all of the THC and other cannabinoids that you are looking to get out of the plant, 
but you'll also be pulling out a lot of the waxes and things in higher quantities comparative to the THC than you would if you dialed it in more accurately using a passive system. So you end up with a less pure, just inherently, uh, end product. Am I am I still on screen? Okay, good. Yeah, you're end good. product than um, you do if you're doing it passively. Uh, but the real issue comes in with the pumps. You see all these closed loop systems, the only pump on the market that they can use is uh, something called a refrigeration reclamation pump, a refrigerant reclamation pump. And um, these pumps are designed to be used with non-food grade uh, refrigerant. And so what happens is uh, with the refrigerant, it has its uh, its own uh, um, lubricant oil or uh, lubricant built in to the refrigerant itself. And so right. the pumps are designed to take that into account. They have uh, no uh, lubricants in them at all, no oils or anything. That's why they're used in the first place is because they're clean. They don't have any lubricants to drop into your oil. But they do have a little bit gap in there uh, for the pump to uh, accept the lubricant. And when you don't have any lubricant, you've just got a gap. And that's constantly leaking butane in small quantities. And also when you're pumping, it heats up because it doesn't have its proper lubricant. And these pumps are made out of uh, generally lead coated in chromium. And that will melt and fuse together, stopping your pump from working. And, and keep in mind, this is, this is your pump metal melting while working with butane. And I don't know about you, but that doesn't seem like a good idea to me. I don't want molten metal in my butane mixing in a lab. That's a recipe for disaster. I was going to ask then if also, that process caused heat. Go ahead. You answer that question. It does cause heat by recirculating like that. So, okay. Sorry. Uh, yes, it, well, well, the yes. real problem Seeds is the and lubricant, lack of lubricant. Yeah. And so the, the pumps will actually seize up. They'll, they'll fuse together, yeah. And another thing that will happen is um, in depending on the design of the closed loop system, now now inherent in the closed loop system is this this pump that'll drop chromium and lead into your end product. But also, depending on the system, you can have your oil that you're extracting splash onto parts of the pump, and that can actually eat away at the metals even faster. Uh, so you'll get pock marked. Uh, internal parts of your pump. I and mean, this is all studied stuff. I, I'll actually, as soon as I'm done talking, I'll see if I can find the uh, a, a paper on it. I'll link it in the chat so that you can do your own reading in your own time because the things we bring to the table, we like to have actual research on them. Uh, and other this, like, oh, yesterday I threw this together and it made me really high, so therefore it's the best thing ever. No, no, we want, like, real research, and that's kind of how we try and work on this. So uh, it, 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 these pumps just unanimously uh, in the closed loop systems drop nasties into your end product. And these issues have been brought up in the industry. And basically, since it's not a, it's, well, it's under, it's generally uh, under, done under the radar, it's not regulated, this, that, and the other thing, nobody cares. The people who the, the people who make the refrigeration rec, refrigerant reclamation pumps don't care. They have been told, or or suggested, or or asked to stop selling to the marijuana industry because of the obvious dangers, and they just don't care because people from the industry keep buying and they keep putting it on their website, and so. Anybody using a classic closed loop system with a pump, danger, danger, danger. So they, they need that's, to stop that's that. We need to stop. Yeah, that. needs to stop. They're, we're poisoning they're, people. They're, they're, and that's, they're that's killing not okay. their customers, and they run the risk of blowing their asses up. Oh, and not to mention these heavy metals when you when you smoke them, uh, cause like headaches, nausea, things like that, and these can easily be mistaken for the effects of whatever you're smoking. And so people don't even realize they're being poisoned. That's just wrong. 
Yeah, that's true across the board. A lot of people do, don't realize what they use as a vessel or what smoking something or how what they do that can cause actual get you high kind of, but it's really you're being poisoned. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly, Roger. Right. And, you know, the information should be out there, you know, like, and, and I think maybe there's, you know, obviously there's a need that needs to be filled as well. You know, I think that, you know, in addition to, you know, consumers needing education, uh, you know, there, there needs to be a professional option for the industry to have too. Like right now, if there's not, like you're saying, there's not really another option, then well, you know, the information is. yeah, needs to be out there so that, you know, somebody who does, you know, we already had somebody on the show, what was that, last week or the week before from a shipping company that took advantage of an opportunity that came about from the cannabis industry. And, you know, it sounds like we need the same thing to happen here from an industrial company to step up and make a, a pump that will fit the needs of the industry and then, nope. you know, make a bunch of money. There's an easier solution and it's cheaper and it's more effective. It gets you higher yields it's ultimately safer. It's running at pressures of under 125 PSI. Uh, I mean, that's basically the kind of pressure that you're holding your pee at. You know, it's it's we're talking real low pressures here, and that's that the almost passive, too good to be true. Yeah, well, passive Roger, systems. But... So a passive system. The difference between a closed loop system and a passive is a closed loop system. You're a cheap bastard, and you're running your solvent through multiple times. The way to avoid this is you run a three to one or preferably a four to one load ratio. So if you're running a kilo of plant material, you run four kilos of your solvent. And then you move through the column and from solvent tank to solvent tank by heating the solvent up in one side and then throwing dry ice or whatever in the other. And there's zero pumps. It's faster, it's cheaper, it's not running at the same pressures, and you run zero potential of introducing any of the cooties that we've talked about. It's going to cost you more, but you're so much safer, and more importantly, the people who are you know, being so kind as to give money to your family for doing this work, you're not poisoning them. You know, Keep your customer around longer is what we think. How is it cheaper but costs more? I'm just curious. That kind of threw oh, me a little bit. Oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, the, uh, <laughs> you, you need some more. You can, you're going to need better design tanks, not the crap that's out there. Oh, maybe so you, setup, original setup costs more. Correct. Your machine is going to cost more, but it's going to save your ass. And if you do a bomb grip in between one step or the other, you're, you're not going to pay with your life for it. And, you know, what happens is like somebody's kind of going along and they're trying to do things on the cheap. I think as, you know, some people are a little bit older, we, we need to like let them know, hey, spend a little extra money, get yourself a system that can do passive. You can build these yourself too. Uh, and then also you want to make sure you're not using the, the uh, rubber gaskets. There's certain kinds of gaskets and stuff you want to use also. But once you have a passive system, and you have your solvent, your solvent, you get to keep it. You're not constantly losing it through a pump. You're never running the risk of blowing up because you're going through a pump. And you the the efficient you, you can dial things into a gnat's ass. And that's how you win a cup. Not just by like, wow, I, that uh, batch came out good or this batch came out good. You can hit your mark every flip in time with a passive system. I popped that link up into the chat. I may have scrolled past it by now, but there is a link in the chat for um, an article on what I just spoke of. So th that's that's kind of our soapbox on the systems that are out there. And I'm not naming names, but you recognize them with the orange signs and everything. And all the YouTube people are all excited because they got you know uh, an extraction system for a dollar three eighty. And it's just freaky, freaky dangerous. And then with that attitude of where people say, hey, this is just the way I do it. You know, it works for me. But if you're doing something else that works for you, we need to stop that shit right now. If somebody's doing something else that's dangerous to them and we love them, we need to say, you're being a dumbass. 
and let's get them the real information, turn them on to a passive system if they're uh, you know, going to be doing extractions. Or what happens is very often the home user sees that they can get into a closed loop system for really cheap and they're just trying to do like, oh, this one's $400, this one's $350, I'm buying the $350. Well, what did you give up for 50 bucks? So our other side of this is if there are people that have some stuff laying around the house that they want to turn into medibles, there's some old school, ridiculously cheap methods. It's not, you're not going to be able to put it on a nail, you know, mostly like for eating or you can also get your, uh, it, it's mostly for eating kinds of stuff. But, that, you know, if you're home and you're trying to do it yourself, you're usually trying to stretch your your molecules of THC as long as you can. And if that's what you're after, eating is really the best way. And uh, we're looking forward to uh, doing some online videos or teaching some classes as we get a little steady uh, about doing things like extraction into coconut oil. There's so many scientific reasons to do it. It's easy, nobody dies. And if you only have a little bit of money, there's no better way that we've found to date to stretch your money further if you don't have tens of thousands of dollars to invest in equipment. If you're just at home taking care of a loved one and you know you can only get so many ounces of stuff and you want to make sure that person's pain is taken care of as much as you can, a cold vacuum or a sealed extraction directly into coconut oil for roughly eight days at low temperatures in the neighborhood of like 118 degrees, will make some stuff that you put a spoon of that oil in your mouth in 40 minutes, you can't find your ass with both hands. So if people, and that's what, there's a lot of people, they just want to get high and they want to do it as cheap as they can. I think we need to let them know, yes, Here's a way you can do it. You'll get blasted. Uh, and no matter what, no matter how high you are, you're not going to kill yourself or your family who's in the next room. You know, people run this stuff in their garage. The well, kids the are in the playpen in the next room. We need to make sure that we, do we never we never allow anybody to do this in a damn room. It needs to be done outside. It needs to be outside and extremely air. If you're anywhere near like uh, something, can, you need extreme evacuation like you would for a greenhouse. Can, yeah, if you, have a, if you have a good flow hood in your lab, you can absolutely do it indoors, but it has to be no, safe. Just like, no, no, you don't have, you have, no, 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 Steve, Steve, that's not true. Oh, you, really? If you're running that, in the lab, know, okay, so let me explain it this way. You have to way. run Colorado. positive pressure through the lab. Yeah, in Colorado, they they run them in the indoor labs, but it's it's in a separate room that has the whole ceiling is a vent hood that's sucking air at a pretty incredible yeah. rate. More, like more often, more often, more yeah. often you're blowing air into the room. Yeah, you're blowing you air and sucking anything. it out at the same time. Yeah, yep. you don't yep. want anything electric on the tail. And once you're in the butane zone, you can have nothing electric from the butane zone on because you can spark. You can force air in. And, yep. and that's the best way to set up a lab is, you know, you're yep. forcing air in and it just vents. That, that's exactly. mostly what people do. If they're not go. doing that, you're scared. No, no, no. But I'm saying is they have the – That's nice thing about they the have, oil. They have the, they're you pumping air into the bottom and then they're, they have the, the, bear, the outtake that's at the top. The and they're pulling yes, it that's the way. Yeah. That's the way. Yeah, just set up a couple actually, can you fans. You air in. Yeah, you actually a couple can fans. And you're getting a couple can fans would not work. That would definitely blow you up the roof. No, the best way to do it. Do not. In other words, no one, unless you're a business or got a shit pot of money, yes. can afford to buy the filtration system you need to grow or to do this you process. Be doing it outside. Inside. Yep. So we get back outside. to where we were. We got Rides you got right. We're in a big giant. If you got a hood, you could do it in a place with shade, but it better be open on both ends. And you need to have a. You need to be doing it be where you got a big fan sucking it away from you. No, yeah, no, you not want blowing not in sucking. It. Blowing. A blow job's always better. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, we just got to that. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Positive pressure. Positive, Positive pressure, pressure, correct. Yeah, it's not like you're doing, yeah, when you're doing 
with peat moss you want it to be sucked through the fan but yeah uh yeah with uh with with oil yeah i guess with gas you'd want it blowing past you you're right away six, from you so six percent in the atmosphere is going to blow scary so by having positive pressure and actually if you're setting it up you want to blow the air in from the top and you want your vents on the bottom because butane sinks so you don't want to try and suck a concentration of these molecules off the floor through the ceiling you want to blow through the ceiling and let it escape naturally through the floor and I'm people don't know this stuff. Seen. I'm not yeah, trying no, to I'm just weird. explaining what I've, what I've seen in Colorado, that's all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it has people, to, if you did have it above, more, you, I know. you could say that residual would be floating in the air. So that makes sense too, maybe, especially if it's proven that it's heavier than air and it's going to fall. Oh, it is. It is. So, it falls. Yeah. Yeah. So you have to have a downdraft system. Correct. Proven. That's one of the reasons when you have uh, gas leaks in houses that they take a while to explode. All the gas sinks and collects at the bottom until it reaches the level of a pilot light, and then boom. Boom. <laughs> well, thanks, Do you, you guys know why there's a smell of the, the sulfur is added to natural gas? Do you guys know why? Yep. So you know it's there. Yep. So you can actually Do you know what event? Do you know what event started it? There was a, in Texas, they used to give uh, natural gas for free to schools and municipal buildings. And there was a school that had a leak in the basement. No one smelled it, and it detonated, and ended up pretty much, you know, killing all the ki oh. most of the kids and the and the, wow. and the family in it. And back in the early 1900s, uh, like 1912, 1920s, 19 teens, 1920s, something like that. And really? um, after right. that, yep. And then after that, they added that smell to it so that they could tell, you know, you know, if it's leaking, no, oh. because yeah, humans, yeah. Can detect, humans can detect humans uh, can detect. Um, uh, sulfur is like two parts per million, or, or, or yeah. uh, it's super, super low. Yeah, it's because it's stinky. Smells like your uncle's fart. Well, no, because it cues in on rotten meat. Well, actually, will give yeah. off sulfur. So you, it's a, it's a food thing that we're evolved to smell. Mm -hmm. Just like my uncle's fart. Kind of yeah. like when, kind of <laughs> like when you run out. There's David. Kind of like when you run out of. Uh, uh, a butane or a propane on your on your camper you can smell that or your your uh, your gas stove you can smell that yup out of fuel you can you get that smell right before it's gone but all of the all of the solvents supposed to i mean if you're not using this you should actually be spanked but all of the solvents the butanes and the propanes and everything that we use in extraction are 100 percent smell less you cannot tell that they are odorless. They're they're almost like inert gases. Uh, I mean, they're just basic, you know, carbon compounds. So there's there's nothing there to stimulate your olfactory stuff. So it's even worse in the lab because if you're using good butane for good extract, you cannot smell it, which is why yeah, your well, methodologies have to be perfect because you can't tell anything's wrong until you blow. Right, because companies like Vector have gone up to. Re to 13 times refined to where and, and you know they did it for this exact process you know they went to a five times where i always wondered why do all my butane lighters go out then i started i got a vaporizer then i found out why all my lighters always took a shit because i was using ronsonol you know so we start buying vector and you know they had to quintuple refined and then all of a sudden one day i said 13 refined i said okay i wonder why they developed that stuff you know so that's they what have it even, that's they even what have I, it more refined than methods, that. They're running them through filters. The only way, legitimately, and again, uh, I'll say this brazen. I know this is always nasty in the marijuana industry. Really, the only way to know is you get your solvents in your own shop and you distill them yourself before you ever bring them to your cannabis. Just like and, no matter how much you filter water, you can't get it the same level as distilled water. It just doesn't work that way chemically. Same thing with the butane. Yeah, you, you need to do your own distillation, separate it yourself. You'll find, the, the they call it mystery oil. It's like, wow, I thought I had pure stuff, and what's this mystery oil in the bottom of my recovery? That's the nasty shit through the processing. So even if you're getting good quality stuff, if you're a semi-decent extractor or higher, you're going to do your own purification 
And now you know if you're in a passive system, I now have 100% pure butane in my system and all I need to do is change temperatures to move it through the different areas of the system, whether it's distracting or, or boiling you know, the butane off. And that way you're not leaving any of those mystery oils uh, from manufacture in your high quality extracts that you're trying to win a cup with. That is pretty awesome. That is super cool information for people going forward. And thank you for sharing this. I'm blown away. I love you. I love your concept. I, you know, I'm sure everybody does. And I'm, this is the first time I've really got to talk to you and find out what you were all about. So, you know. We're just yeah, nerds. That. We're yeah, just nerds. I know the guys know you, but I, I, I met you once on the show before and we had a good time, you know. Yeah, so I remember you. Yeah. Yeah. So, but thanks for sharing that. Yeah, and yeah. because Dave, David's big into extracts and stuff like that, and I'm sure he's going nuts over here uh, thinking about it. Oh, I love it. I know exactly what you're saying. I mean, it is the most dangerous thing you can think of because it has no smell, and mm -hmm. I stay as far away from everything as I can when I'm outside doing it. And I don't even use heating plates. I don't use none of that crap. I use hot water. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's just, it's too dangerous. People, people would be better. I mean, I'll, I'll eventually on here or, or somewhere wind up teaching even isopropyl alcohol. You know, if you're gonna, if you have to have dabs at home, you can do isopropyl alcohol outside. It's cheap. Uh, and as long as you have a purging oven, you know, you can get the nasty out of there, but that's way safer than dealing with the freaky butane stuff. Absolutely. Yeah. And butane I've actually you, even done it that way. Yeah. I've butane will get you a pure extract, but you just <laughs> damn well better have the proper equipment and you damn well better know what you're doing. And unfortunately, a lot of people do like 10 minutes of research. They don't actually know how to research. And unless you're in the industry where you're dealing with OSHA and, you know, I, I come from a contracting background where we yep. had OSHA on these huge job sites yep. and you damn well better have your shit in place or they're going to spank your ass. Well, that's a good and point. Shut you, down. you can always build your shit like you got OSHA up your ass and you'll be safe. Perfect. In the process. There you go, Roger. Right, Roger. Yeah. So <laughs> that's our passion. That's our stuff we're trying to bring. And then, you know, we want to show people, what the real ways to extract based on chemistry, if you were working for Dow Chemical, how would you do it? Or if you're working in a pharmaceutical yeah. lab, how would you do it? And then we understand you don't have $100,000 worth of equipment. <laughs> what can you do at home, get badass results, and keep you and your loved ones safe? And Not so that, that's what we're gonna hope to bring you know, in future episodes and stuff. Cool, that's awesome. I think the yeah. safest thing is just to you know, stick to flour, but you know, that, that's just me. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, the coconut oil is harmless. You, you it's really hard to all make. All there's the plant there's there, nothing yeah. you can run into along the way that it'd be a danger. This will definitely get me out. I don't know. I've heard some people I say that too much coconut oil gives a leaky true. asshole. So, Never failed. leakage. I hate that. I hate that. Never failed. <laughs> <laughs> There's actually some evidence to show that heavy, heavy coconut u internal use long term can cause prostate issues, some prostate issues in guys. Um, but it, that's if you like live in the Caribbean kind of thing. Yeah. Interesting. So that's well, our so what a tablespoon a day. Yeah, I mean that you may. Then we're talking eating like in a shit ton, like deep frying yeah. stuff yeah. in it every day, like not, not just eating. You know, you can eat a little bit every day and be fine. And we're talking like. It being the main, you know, grease or fat in your diet kind of thing. So, so that, that, you guys want to talk? There, Go ahead. Was there anything else you wanted us to cover, or should we shut up now and let everybody else? No, no, else... no. no. Here if we you, go. you want to talk a little bit more about edibles, you guys have some pretty cool recipes for you know easy homemade edibles. Um, you know, maybe some you know a little bit on the uh, on coconut oil, okay. or maybe a simple simple guide for people that maybe have grown maybe their first couple plants. They got a little bit of trim, or they have some bud that maybe didn't come out quite as good as okay. they were hoping, right. but it doesn't have any mold on it or anything. What what can they do with that, and, and how can they turn that into something that's usable in their own kitchen? Maybe you know, maybe with sure. water instead of coconut so oil. I value my prostate. The uh, <laughs> the, the best. <laughs> 
Yeah. Uh, sunf sunflower oil is another great one, is if, aside from coconut oil. Sunflower oil and coconut oil have a couple of extra compounds that help to extract a little bit more ter ter uh, terpenes and cannabinoids yeah. and some of the others. And I'll let you talk about that because you know more sure. about this stuff than I do. Okay. Yeah, sure, sure. Uh, it, it, what you're after, if you're going, I call it low and slow. If you want to have some good quality medibles, plan on having them in two weeks. Okay, just just plan on that. So, you take your your source material, and if you're after the THCs, obviously you're going to want to do your decarbing. And uh, for basic decarbing, let's just say you do the regular oven thing. There are better ways to do it, but let's say you just do the basic oven thing at around three fifty ish or so, and you're what like. 16 minutes or something in there um, that will turn a lot of your t uh, THCAs into t active THC then take oh and when you're doing your decarbing here's a bonus tip take big mason jars okay put your source material in the mason jar seal the mason jar and then do your decarbing in the oven hit your times and temperatures you can put probes inside the mason jar. Inside the mason jar, and your terpenes are going to start to uh, release out of your product, but you're leaving it in a sealed mason jar, so don't worry about it. Hit your time and your temps, test your material, and then let let your material completely cool back to room temperatures. Let it go for hours. It doesn't matter. Remember, you're not going to eat this for two weeks. Do not rush this. So your terpenes will reabsorb into the plant matter. Right. So because you're using temperatures that are going to liberate them, let them in a sealed. If you can smell your decarboxylating, you're doing it wrong. You're whatever you're smelling, you're not smoking, you're not eating. Those are molecules that you pay dearly for. I'm a cheap bastard. I'm going to tell you how to keep them. So you put them in a sealed mason jar. You let them liberate, they will reabsorb into the material. Then you can take those sealed mason jars and put your coconut oil in them. I suggest an organic coconut oil. The reason you're using a coconut oil is a uh, saturated fat that does not behave like a saturated fat in your body, but its polarity uh, is unbelievably awesome at pulling the things we want out of the cannabis plant. However, it takes time. It's not butane. It's freaking coconut oil. Think about it. You don't strip paint off your car with coconut oil. You would use a heavy solvent, like a, a high hydrocarbon, like a butane. So now you have your jar. You've let it cool down. You put your coconut oil in there. Seal the top back on it again. It goes into the oven for five days at 118 degrees. Five days. Then you strain that oil out, you squeeze it out with a cheesecloth and everything, you fill it with oil again, and it goes for another three days. Then you mix both of those together, and that coconut oil, that a quarter teaspoon of it is, you are so there. A half a teaspoon of it, you're not driving your car. A full teaspoon of it, we're talking date rape. You're going to be grabbing yourself in places you've never grabbed yourself before. <laughs> it's crazy strong. Uh, do not mix it up with your CBD oil. I made that mistake once. It was it was frightening. I ate three tablespoons of the stuff thinking it was CBD oil, and I it was it was scary. I almost go to the hospital. Scary. And so and that's one a of the really reasons um... method that you can have that is ultimately safe. And you can just eat the oil. You can rub it on your body. You can put it in body cavities. Uh, I can tell you reasons why you'd want to do that kind of stuff too. But uh, it's it's you, you it's so cheap, and it is the most bang for your buck at home that you can get. Period. End of story. I defy anybody to show me a better method. Whenever you said internals, Steve had the best look on his face. <laughs> <laughs> well, read I actually the panel, read the panel note, chat. Read yeah. the panel chat. It's worthy of note that uh, this method uh, of making the coconut oil. Who's getting rated? Who's uh, getting rated? Uh, also, mm, ooh, they're playing my song. Uh, it will That's also be very useful. Master, 
Absolutely. for um, uh, more of a couch locky kind of feel because this converts a lot of the uh, chemicals into T oh, CBN. Yeah. So you end yeah. up with a high CBN concentration in your final product. So you get that heavy couch lock feel and it's uh, um, more effective for a, um, a tired kind of feel than a, than like a, a sativa being bright and like uh, it, it's it's not like a caffeine sativa. It's more like a sedative indica in that sense. It's got more of a CBD, CBN. We've watched people literally slide down the wall after eating this stuff. <laughs> literally. Yep. Well, a lot it's of just people like hit them and they're like, hey. yeah. What are your thoughts on crock pot? What are your thoughts on crock pot cooking? Uh, crock pot is very very close. Magical However, butter. However. You can smell it cooking as long as you're cooking it. If you can smell it, those are molecules that you paid for that's not going into your body. And it stinks up the house. Why do you want to stink up the house? Or turn on the neighbors or whatever. By doing it in the sealed mason jars, everything stays in there. Your terpenes, your everything stays in there. Gotcha. If you paid for it, you know, if you want to give it away, give it to me. Just don't give it away to the atmosphere. It makes sense. So I wonder if you could do it in like a, like a canning setup. You know, like where they had because yes. they do a lot Russian of like cooker. the old mason jar. You know, they're right. making them up. Right. You just don't need that high a temperature though. Canning, you're at right. a much higher canning too. You right. only need to be be at 118 degrees. Mm -hmm. There you, you go. That's you go for days rather than, oh, I can get it out now. If you want to get everything out of your source material, you're a cheap bastard like me. We got mm -hmm. Scott in our family background. If a nickel went rolling by in front of us, me and Dorian could tell you the date. Okay? <laughs> so if you paid for it, you might as well have it. And this is the – it takes time, but it this is the stuff that makes – the baddest ass metables of anything we've ever made. And not to mention how easy it is to work coconut oil into a food. Yeah. Right. I mean, you can do savory or sugar or like butter or anything either. Hot coffee, for instance. It's quite nice. Much better shelf life, too. Yeah. Yeah, you don't get the problems of a can of butter with the shelf life. Oh. Yeah, this coconut oil is one of my biggest selling products. Actually, it is my biggest selling product do wanna, currently. Do you want to? They touch buy it, it by my... the gallon from me. It's a great lube too. Didn't you sell it as a lube for a bit? Well, actually, yes. Uh, for women, I was married to a baby catcher, uh, OBGYN, and when women get into be my age group, the walls of the vagina don't stretch like they used to. So a woman can get excited, she can be wet, you know, breathing heavy and want to go. And yet, you know, you start dealing with the rod and it's just fucking painful. And, and, it, and it breaks a lot of women's heart because they, you know, they love their mate. They want to do the sex thing. It just absolutely hurts them. Well, you take some of this THC oil, uh, half THC, uh, half CBD oil, and you just need like a quarter teaspoon of it. And you part of your foreplay, you put it up the woo woo, uh, and you give it about 15, What's 20 minutes. That's that thing you're going to be spanking with your rod That's a little true. later on. And uh, so, oh, it's it's my palm. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Well, then, well, see, actually, this doesn't work for the guys. This only works for the gals, but it will relax the walls of the vagina, uh, and it affects them a bit hormonally. They'll actually get a bit high down there from that. But most importantly, you get to go to the playground. Um, so, and then your, your, your mate uh, isn't like looking at you like your Satan spawn the, the next day from having gotten jiggy with it. Um, so that, that's, I, I learned about this issue because of who I was married to. And I've done some personal experimenting with this stuff. And it's brilliant. I mean, absolutely brilliant. Um, and so that, that that's actually a product line we're looking at uh, developing specifically for that uh, with a little applicator to go up in there, you know, and 
something to take in an app to take pictures with your phone, you know, to do science and everything. <laughs> I love this guy. <laughs> it's like, hey, science, like science should be fun. He's the love guru for weed. <laughs> yeah. That's so awesome. That's a whole new industry, man. Chuck. Yeah. yeah. I'm, buy I'm buying websites every time you, every other paragraph. <laughs> I've got, I just bought 3 com since you've been talking. <laughs> <laughs> hey, how many, here's a question on that note, since I think a couple people in this thing buy URLs <laughs> on a regular basis for business related reasons. How many phone calls do you guys get about web development per day? I get at least five. I deal with it all day, so I'm usually making the phone calls. So, but yeah. But, uh, but, uh, yeah you well, I mean, oh, here's the one calling me then, you asshole. Yeah, he's calling you, Steve. That's oh, no, I'm talking about websites. We haven't really done any website work. Other than, I'm just you know, kidding. Yeah, I I do call I do call on Steve though. He answered a question for me the other day. It was pretty cool. I did I wasn't sure, and I actually had something today come up that was kind of interesting. Uh, it, you know what, why don't you talk about that for a minute because we're gonna I'm I'm working on trying to get us a guest to talk about that topic actually. We'll we'll cut back to Tommy in a second, but uh, since we're on this topic, I don't know who's supposed to go forward. So to, to clarify, um, Roger had asked about what kind of medibles are best for pets, and we're actually going to yeah. get a medible pet company. I'm working on trying to book one. Oh, I, I happen to know some stuff on that. Okay, yeah, okay, cool. That, that, awesome. Why, why don't you tell us about it? Okay, I, I happen to work with a dog breeder, and this woman is insane with her dogs. Uh, she has a double garage, excuse me, not a double garage, a double closet with multiple holes for all the dog's uh, clothes, but she used to breed Great Danes. One of her Great Danes, a breeding male, sold for $40,000. This is a dog, okay? So this woman no, no dogs. Yeah. CBD until end stage, end stage is the only thing you give dogs. CBD. Yeah, dogs don't do well with THC. It, it really, really affects them and not in a good way. Right. We knew that to an extent. Yeah. How about cats? Isn't isn't there an issue with it CBD versus CBDA? Isn't the CBDA and THCA much better for dogs and cats than the CBD and THC themselves? Or that was kind of something I was told before. Maybe you can speak more on. Yeah, primarily the 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 THCs. <laughs> the dogs don't do well with it. Uh, they do phenomenally with just a little CBD. Uh, I mean, it's amazing. It's like it's kind of like giving a dog catnip, giving them CBD, like a, a mid-aged dog to an older dog. They're like they turn into a puppy. They're happy. They don't get any wonky stuff. You can always tell when a dog's a bit under uh, stress. But end stage, when the dog's got cancer and you don't quite have it in your heart to put the dog down yet that's when you give them or their taste. hips are starting to hurt because you know older dogs they will often have hip issues well, so, well here's what yeah. the question actually was if i can bring this across since you've done something and we were talking about it the question what i all right i answer all the questions for the blog at robert bergman's uh i love growing marijuana.com and and then i also answer the email questions uh, well, we got an email question from a, a somebody the other day that said they their, they had given their dog CBD oil, but it was allergic, and then asked something that neither uh, that I really didn't know how to clarify to Steve about is there something with, with like is there strains that would have a different protein or something where I guess the allergy caused by a protein is what she's thinking. I'm not really sure because it was a short little question. But Great. Great questions. What what I would say, unfortunately, with our industry, just because somebody told you it was CBD oil doesn't mean it was. What was the extraction process? Were they doing it with these pumps? Were they putting something else in there? If it's a pure CBD, like I talked about making with the coconut oil, you right. can never hurt your dog with it. You cannot hurt your dog with it just cannot do it. So you take an ACDC or one of the genetics that Steve's developing, you make your extract with that. There's no possible way of hurting your dog with that. 
So okay, make now, yourself know the source material, know the method. But you know, sometimes if something's not good enough for people, they sell it for pets. You don't know that it doesn't have molds or metals or anything like that in there. That's a hell of an alternative concept on this whole thing. We were looking at we were looking at the THC content for one because we both believe that THC, you know, full force like we we inhale or you know. Uh, Chest is would is not good for animals, our dogs and our pets. Correct. And, and then Steve Correct. suggested THCA and CBDA all all only to find and see if it could be like that. But she actually said CBD oil. So now that's a good good con. I, I will have to bring if, that up because our you, company. Yeah. We and also, how much did she give the dog? Because it, dogs need so much less, not just body weight, but even per body oh, weight, dogs need yeah. less than humans do. And good. so if you give them too much, it's it's not a happy dog anymore. If you right. are going to give THC to a dog when it's that time, what you do is you take your THC source material, you do the same kind of CBD, uh, Dad. extraction. Huh? CBD, not THC. No, oh, if you are giving THC. You to a dog? Do to a dog, oh. you do complete cold processing. You never take it up above 80 degrees. So it's going to take you two weeks in the oven at 80 degrees. Okay, yeah, that's your, slow, that's your slow process you're talking about, how you do it slow and safe. You, instead do of not decarboxylate it. You want it raw. And raw THC is not going to get you high. Huh. Uh, yeah, oh, so you want to give the animal the raw THC. Correct. You want really cold process. More like a matter like eating grass. Kind of like... Yes, almost. that's how a dog does. Yes. Yes, yes exactly. Yeah. You can ah. give a dog THC leaves. You know, put leaves in their plant, and just the raw THC that's not been decarboxylated, not psychoactively, will benefit an animal. But still, even just that, you should save that for more of the end stages for the dog rather than just giving it to them because THC is good for me, it must be right. good for the dog. No, that's right. just not true. Right. So so we want to give them CBD when they're having that yes. issue. And, yeah. They love CBD. Oh, my God. And you yeah. don't care whether it's dog is like, or it's like or catnip whatever. for a dog. And But answer this for us to clarify. You don't care if it's CBD, A, B, whatever? Correct. Correct. Okay. So what, what about, about um, cats? Is it any different? I haven't had that much experience with cats. I can't answer that uh, responsibly. I, I just don't know. I have a cat that's a pothead. That's the reason I'm asking. He loves eating leaves. And do they eat the raw plant? The cats do. Yeah. I know the cats do great with raw cats plants. Cats eat raw plants. Yeah, the cats love the 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 raw plant. I know that much. We had a kitten around the garden at one point, and they. Love the plants. Oh my god, it was like uh, almost yeah, almost yeah. catnip level of the plants. Had to be removed from the grow area. <laughs> my cat's actually kind of nice. He sits at the tent and waits patiently and I hand <coughs> him one and he's good for the day. You guys ever see a grow, you know, especially on Reddit where all the lower leaves, maybe the bottom foot and a half, <laughs> two feet. You ever notice how tall a cat can reach? Now you know <laughs> why they put them grids at this height. <laughs> so, but um, so what about butter? Uh, yeah, the cat's Ganja name is Lollipop. Fish Ganja guy's worried about his prostate. What about butter extracts? Butter <laughs> extracts, you have to consume them very, very quickly. Yeah, and and I would like to point out with the prostate thing, we're talking. Decades. Eating like three plus cups yeah. a day of oil for, for that to be any issue. In smaller yeah. amounts under a cup, coconut oil is actually very healthy. A lot of people just eat raw coconut oil as a dietary supplement to improve yeah. their health. That's true. Eating coconut oil in the levels that you would eat it with this, you know, uh, 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 marijuana oil would not in any way Absolutely. Uh, cause the negative health issues of, of large amounts of coconut oil. But uh, fish has a really sensitive prostate, so maybe it's that. Oh. That, that <laughs> I suppose. <laughs> Probably needs a prostate massage. That's always fun. Steve? 
<laughs> um, yeah, so, I'm going to have to take a hard pass on, on that one there, Tommy. <laughs> I guess it depends who's doing it for him. Yeah. Uh, even self Did I have a glass of wine first or not? Uh, so, what about, so what about butter? Well, butter, uh, there's with the milk solids that are in butter and with the instability of butter, uh, it's, it can go rancid very, very quickly. Uh, it's a saturated fat like coconut oil, but it doesn't have quite the same structure. A, a butter behaves like a saturated fat in the extraction process. It also behaves like a saturated fat in your body. The difference with coconut oil is it behaves like a saturated fat for your extraction process, which you want, but it does not behave like a saturated fat inside of a mammal. Awesome. So do you, do you want to talk also a little bit about how um, uh, a little bit, of, you know, sunflower oil is also a little bit better than olive oil if you're looking to do an oil. Do you want to touch a little bit on that? Yeah. You seem to know sure. a little bit about that. I don't understand the science behind sure. it, but I know that the one's better than the other. Here's the best rule of thumb that I can give you. If you're going to put cannabis in an oil, you simply cannot touch coconut oil. Period. End of story. Shut up. Unless you have other science, but everything points to coconut oil being a great uh, medium to get these molecules out. There's just so many reasons chemically to use coconut oil. And if you want the butter flavor, like let's say you're making brownies for the dog, mm -hmm. you, you put your coconut oil in there and you then can add your butter flavor in your cooking. But for a carrier for the molecules that we're after, butter does not hold a candle, doesn't even approach coconut oil, even though it's a saturated fat. Is that silver arm? Yeah. I'm going to mute your mic real quick, buddy. Yeah, I'm fine too. Mute it. I can mute it for you. Okay. Sorry about that, Tommy. Go ahead. Well, I think it's kind of at the end there. If you if you, the choice is between butter or coconut oil, coconut oil is your go-to choice chemically for what we're after, and butter is only for flavor. So, do you also? I know some people also are big fans of olive oil or sunflower oil just because of what they're trying to make. Do you want to touch a little bit about maybe how they would go about that? Sure. Olive oil uh, is not saturated, A, so you're not going to get the molecules out of the plant that you want. It's a decent oil, but for the amounts of oil that we're talking about, you're far better using the efficient solvent. Think of coconut oil like a solvent. You're much better using the coconut oil solvent than you are any other oil. And no if other oil is going to come close. And if you're looking for your product to be in a different oil because, say, you're cooking something and you need that something to have a different oil that you're cooking with, you can uh, extract it using coconut oil and then cut the amount of uh, coconut oil with the marijuana Correct. into whatever oil you're using so as to get the pro – because, like, the coconut oil is going to come out extremely potent, extremely potent. And you'll only need a couple of tablespoons – to make, uh, you know, a couple of servings of something, like a number of servings, mind you. Because keep in mind, you only need like a, a quarter to a half a teaspoon to get the job done. And so then what you do is you just take the, the coconut oil you've made and you cut it into whatever oil that you actually want to use for your cooking process. Hmm. <laughs> I, I don't know if that's confusing. Was that clear, what we're saying there? Well, it's basically you all commensurate with what you're trying to achieve in the end and how many people you're trying to serve. Well, I, guess, I guess my, I guess my question was... I screwed up once. Like, the first time I ever made edibles, I somebody else had given me the butter. So it had already been, already been extracted. It was an old hippie buddy. And he'd given... I'd 
had edibles from him before, so I like I knew it was good, but I never actually made the cookies myself, and so I didn't. Nobody told me any better. He just gave it to me. He was like, "Here, have fun." And so uh, I just looked up a recipe and said, "You know, oh, that's how much butter I need," and I used all that butter for the recipe instead of, you know, what normally you would do is use, you know, mostly normal butter and a little bit of cannabis butter. When they were Somebody got strangled online. Yeah. Somebody had. They got it. It sounded like they sucked out in a vacuum. <laughs> yeah, that was weird. Anyway, so I, I made my first batch of edibles I ever made were very, very strong, um, completely on accident. So what, basically what he's saying is if you, when you're cutting it into your recipe, you don't have to use the entire amount of whatever it is. You can use a little bit of coconut oil and butter or a little bit of coconut oil and whatever else goes into your recipe. But just your delivery method for the cannabis is delivery method. That was a yeah. good term. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well now, okay, I got what you're saying. You're saying if it calls for X amount of fat or butter, you don't have mm -hmm. to have all of it with the cannabis. No. In it. You, no. What if someone is what butter or is a fat? Don't do that. <laughs> Your wife will eat half a cookie and then end up rocking back and forth in the shower like she's autistic or something. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, what if, like, um, she'll want to call 911. If you ever heard the cop that called 911 on himself after he, he had too many. Oh, yeah, yeah. He sounded just like that. I had to talk her out of calling 911. I was like, no. I actually, yeah, it was, <laughs> it, it, it was funny afterwards, but not at the time. Right. And, uh, I was high for probably, I had a cookie and a half because, you know, the normal edible thing to do was like, oh, hey, you know, I, 30 minutes goes by and you're like, oh, these cookies are nothing. Right. right. So I have a cookie. I'll give you a bonus hint. I'll give you a bonus hint if you'd like it. Uh, when you are extracting into coconut oil and you're sending your stuff into the lab, uh, I had a lab got me my results back within an hour. Okay. Well, I can tell you for a fact they don't know what they're doing. Uh, giving you testing on metables. When you bury these molecules in the proper oil, you actually have to leave your sample in the uh, <coughs> extracting stuff that you're gonna put into the high pressure uh, chromatography, uh, right. uh, spectrometry machine. You have to leave it in there for four or five hours to get the oil out, excuse me, to get the molecules that you're trying to test for out of the oil you're back out the of coconut it. oil will bind it so well that you're you you will know what your percentages should be going into the testing and if you don't leave it in the solvent long enough for testing your test will come back as if there's nothing in it that's how awesome coconut oil is at getting the molecules it binds the molecules so well that you can't do a regular test because like like if you just have a flower and it's like a methylene chloride or something like that is your main test uh solvent that you then dissolve everything in a flower within minutes is going to pull everything out and give you proper levels in your testing if you hide that molecule in a well done coconut oil mixture in order to run your testing you have to pull the molecules back out of the oil where and, and so this is where testing gets really, really freaky. Uh, you, you have to know those steps. And, and God forbid you do some of the special processes that I do that bind the molecule and make it even more bioavailable. I've had tests come back from the lab that basically say there's nothing in there. Yet if you ate a half a teaspoon of it, yeah, you're ready for a Grateful Dead concert. You know, just like boom. <laughs> yet... It comes back from the lab saying, oh, there's only two milligrams in there. No, there are 10 milligrams in there, but we did such a, an efficient job of getting them out and getting them ready to go into your body that if you don't do a four or five hour test, it's just simply not gonna show up. Right. And these no. again are, are, are basic chemistry things that apparently the industry is not that hip to yet. Yeah, because when these things bind, they form a different molecule. It, it shows up different in the machine. Right. 
that's why we kind of why we started the show too because so much of the cannabis industry and the aquaponics industry and all these other industries isn't based on science and actual numbers and data it's like oh well this worked and it's like well that doesn't tell me shit right got a crow scolding me to leave yeah uh, yeah, I feel like so much of it is, you know, like people just deciding what they think is the best way to do it or a way to do it or some way that works. And then they they do it and have any amount of success at all. So whether it's really successful or a little bit successful, they've still only done it one way and then claim that that way is the best, even though they have nothing to compare it to. And that, you know, like that happens over and over and over again. Like anytime, you know, like, uh, you know, whether I'm watching somebody's YouTube videos or reading a blog or certain newsletters that we've uh, we've touched on in the past about aquaponics <laughs> and, and <laughs> misinformation, uh, I you know I I always remember that when when you see somebody that's proclaiming something with really no <laughs> comparison, um, I you know like it's really ha has no value to it. Like really, I feel like the only weight to it that <clears throat> can even exist most of the time is uh is your own bias like there's really besides that you know you're just saying okay well this is the best way that it could ever possibly work because i did it and i had this much success measured against nothing it really right. you know like there's plenty of old ladies that grow plants in their front yard too it doesn't mean that like they're the best gardeners ever and one of them might be the best gardener ever i don't know but if you have nothing to measure it against it's really it's really pointless and you're just, you know, wasting a bunch of people's time and a lot of times handing out information that really, uh, you know, doesn't, doesn't matter. So, yeah. Speaking of which, the largest cannabis plants I've ever saw in Colorado were grown by a little old lady. She had some that were pushing 20 feet in downtown Denver in this little walled in backyard. She had, yeah. it, was, it was incredible. The, the hands down the biggest plants I've ever seen in person were in this little old lady's backyard. She grew about ten or twelve of them every year, and she had she she had her grands or her kids or whatever would help her trim them up, and they were just just the biggest plants I've ever seen. Women make the best growers. Period. They 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 just just it's like it's in their DNA. I'm, I'm always amazed by them. Hell yeah. And in fact, the first class I ever taught, the aquaponic cannabis class, I had a 19-year-old, and she was the oldest person in the class. She was 88 years old, and she invited me to her house the following weekend. I went down there and, and saw her plants, and they were the biggest plants I'd ever seen in person, and to this day are bigger than any of the ones I've ever seen in even California. Women are gentle on plants. They, they have this, like they're communing with them kind of thing. We're like the guys, I run into a problem, I go down to the grow store, what's the poison I can hit it with? And they hit it with poison, they hit it with poison. Women, they kind of think of the plants as their friends, not the enemy. And they move slower, they move gently, they, they're they okay if it takes four days instead of one day, unlike the guys who are impatient, you know, and they want to be players. The women are fine doing it right where the guys you know they want the points on the board or they want whatever you know which is I mean, this is the reason i'm glad i'm a sissy you know because i i kind of straddle the bridge between the women's stuff and the guy stuff <laughs> we can tell by your hat <laughs> <laughs> no 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 serious though I, I think that it's definitely like a weird stigma that a lot of like I don't know. I, I guess that even the term sissy is associated with somebody that's just not necessarily concerned with masculinity in its current definition. Yeah. You know, like, I want it right. I don't, yeah. I don't need it. Yeah. I, I'd rather, I'd rather learn and be right rather than like fronting like really? guys do when they're talking, you know, and like, yeah, I'm all that in a bag of chips. I love it when take, somebody takes me down a notch. I'll give them money. You just made me smarter. Well, that's because you're from San Diego, or you're in San Diego, or everyone talks out their ass and says they're ten times better than bigger than they are. Yeah, I know. It's crazy. Not everybody in San Diego, but yeah, it's a common just, thread in the cannabis yeah. industry in San Diego. How yeah. about that? Yeah. Oh, there was a it good was free. 
Well, see, I think I, I agree with you because, well, what I've done in order to get to where I'm at in, in my career is I've done all everything I can do to try to destroy the growth of plants to prove that that does things that don't work that you're not supposed to do. Like you say, you can't, you have to dispel, you can't just take it as the gospel and that, that, that just, this is the only way it works because we all know this plant will adapt and grow to pre pretty much any freaking way you want to grow it. You could be successful as long as you nurture it. Like ladies, that's the word. I think that's what you're really looking for. They're nurturing, you know? Yeah. So as long as you nurture, because we're doing all kinds of, you know, but doing those experiments is what you're talking about. You do the experiments yourself before you can teach others. You can't right. just say, well, I read Jorge's Savannah's book from, I know everything there is to know about growing pot, because you don't, because shit changed a lot in the last 10 years. I became a moderator in 2006, 2007, and I've uh, been teaching ever since and now run a forum, a major forum, and uh, it just it blows my mind, these people that talk, they read, they copy and paste, and then they challenge you, and you go, well, you can't challenge, have you grown with this, or you done this, or you done? no, well, I have, and that's what I'm telling you. I did it, you know, and it either works or doesn't, you know, because, and like, again, you almost, get, I've done, I've done, I haven't published it yet, but I'm doing a thing uh, with our genetics and all, and, and, and I've been doing, and I started out like a newbie, my first grow was I broke right up front, I'm doing this like a newbie that got his seeds and started them, and now, oh shit, what do I do, you know, and I actually did all kind of stuff, water stressed them, killed some seedlings and everything you know that to prove a point that i could get them to recover and look at what you get don't give up and kind of thing you know you because they're all freaking out when everybody's a new grower so that's uh -huh. how that's the kind of to to purposely do the things you're not supposed to do but so you can when you say this is how you're supposed to do it somebody listening to you goes well i believe you because you you, you posted where you really fucked up some plants <laughs> you know on purpose so, it's called yeah. It's, in the lab, we call that the null hypothesis, and a lot of people think about science is science tells you what is true, wrong. The wrong. scientific method is actually geared for proving ourselves wrong, and that's exactly what you're talking about. I have an idea. I, I think this is such and such. How do I prove myself wrong? Let me run an experiment that if this experiment is correct, it proves my hypothesis wrong. And that's the way to go about this. It's perfect what you're talking about, Roger, perfect. Right, yeah. that's, how, that's how I've gotten, you know, through my career to teach. Yeah, ever, awesome. I've seen my transparency, you know, because, well, I just, again, right off the beginning, I was kind of weird. I just started a whole shitload of seeds myself really you know but i mean i had a plan you know and it all worked out because i had timed it so i started my seeds and got my stuff but i bought some a cheap high bay light and an old 250 hps <laughs> stained unit there wasn't even an led on the market at the time i started with a 400 watt two uh 400 watt uh two by two high bay half metal halide and a 250 diamond self-contained unit you know and and uh -huh. uh, and i had 18 seeds pop <laughs> <laughs> and I made all kinds of bubblers and started in hydroponics and made a bunch of soil mixes and all like that. And so like, well, people say, well, this is the best kind of soil mix to make for yourself. So I made it, you know, this, this is how you do a bubbler. So I've dated, did a bubbler, you know, and then I just kept doing stuff from there and then proving it right or wrong. And, you know, and finding out, well, you don't do this next time or you don't do that next time. And then I was able to start grabbing the attention of people to hire up in the, in the forum industry. Well, I was at cannabis.com which is a joke now, I'm sorry to say, after it was sold from uh, by, by um, Ron Bennett. Ron Bennett owned it when I was a moderator there. And when it was sold, and that's when it was great, it was like 5,000 um, visits a day, member visits nice. a day. You know what I mean? We were rocking the, you know, the cultivation uh, department was killer. Had two, you know, three or four or five great guys working together. And we just kept doing these experiments. I made all kinds of stuff. We were talking about aero cloners. I made my own aero cloner one time, but mm -hmm. I'm, I digress. I'm getting way off, off topic here, but, but uh, yes, I, I, I that, that's exactly how you have to do this. You can't, you, you, if you're like, you're saying, I want, I want some notoriety, but I want people to, 
believe what I say, and I want to have some kind of background behind it, you know, some research. Well, and I call it benchmarks. You were calling a while ago. I meant to get. I call all that a benchmark when I mm -hmm. when. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, you do it hard way. You do it this hard way, but you have now. But so I have to continue. I'm locked into the whole thing. I'm doing a rock full starter to a one gallon to a five gallon cloth pot, one gallon hard nursery pot, not a plastic, not a uh -huh. cloth pot. And then I go into a indoor growing only. I mean, pretty well, you could grow it outdoors, but I think you'd want a bigger pot. Or you know if you're going to do this kind of thing, but it it it's all of it, and I'm using Promex, and then I'm only using the base nutrient systems, and I've been doing side by sides of all the companies using the same thing every time they all get started in Rockwell. I use it, so, you know, I might use some Liquid Karma when they're first young, just give them a little jump, you know, and uh, cheating a little bit. And I'm sorry, we damn Scotts and Miracle Grow and Botanicare and General Hydroponics groups are all taking over the world. <laughs> You know, Roger, a lot, a lot of what I see is just a, a non-understanding of what the scientific method is. And I really hear you uh, calling out to the scientific method, specifically proving what's wrong. That's what science does, is proves what's wrong, not what's right. And that, that's a great way to go about it. But unfortunately, what I see a lot of people do is they're running their experiments and they'll change three to five variables. Well, how the fuck right. do you know which one is what? You don't you have to only change one variable at a time. You know, we were talking and, last week. yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy. The guest on the show last week from uh, Kentucky State, our gentleman from Kentucky State, he was talking about the same thing. We said, well, why don't you do this to get rid of your root rot? And he says, I can't because that's a variable. Then I don't have that data. Correct. And how much root rot and whether it just any, you know, so we, right. it was, so exactly. It's kind of funny. This show after following last week's show is perfect, you know, in that respect. So, yeah. So you got to have benchmarks. I, I teach that too. These guys go, Oh, well, like we had, we went through, we, we've gone through a cow mag re revolution for like 10 years. Well, we, that's only for the Luke method guys, you know, you only need extra cow mag if you're using the Lucas method. Uh -huh. With general hydroponics, you know, three part. That's what. That's where it all came from. And so every time we see some, we've taught that. We actually don't have that on our forum anymore. We taught our members, and we got a great membership. And we taught them that that's not the answer to every yellow leaf or any leaf with damage. It's not cow mag. You know, if you've right. got a, a, if you've got a solid good base nutrient, you've got cow mag in there. You don't need to add because the plant is only going to uptake the cow mag that or the calcium and the magnesium to spread it out for you guys. Um, and then that, only if they have the proper bacteria in the root zone. If right, you don't have the proper thing. bacteria, you only have a one-to-one -one uptake of the calcium, where if you have the proper uh, bacteria in the root zone, you can have a 10,000 to one rather than a simple osmosis. And yeah, right, there's just so many variables, I know. Right, exactly. That's why I love Steve. Like, if you ever think you know something that's going on with growing, just go talk to Steve for a half an hour. <laughs> you realize, I don't know shit. <laughs> that's cool. Yeah, I, it's, it, he's pretty hold, cool. Uh, hold on, I got it. I'm sorry, I have, to, I have to move on for a second, you guys. Silver well, 30. I, Go ahead. I don't want to be hogging the show kinds of stuff. I always love, you know, listen to all you guys. I appreciate you letting us in here, you know, and, and, and we're happy to share whatever. But uh, I always come here to learn. You know, if there's other folks that have stuff, I'm, I'm, I'm ripe and ready to listen. Is there any questions on the chat, Steve? Yeah, does anybody from chat have any questions on uh, extractions or anything? We didn't really have any questions during. I think everyone was kind of just absorbing. <laughs> All right, thanks. Is that, how can people find you if they want to learn uh, more? I know you guys used to do a cannabis content and stuff. Uh, uh, well, my, yeah, my, my, our channel, uh, Dorian and I, and you can just see how much of a noob we were. We, we held nothing back on our channel. It's called Old Fart Grows. Uh, 
lately we've not been doing a grow. Uh, some things happened with the property, and I'm uh, working on moving with Steve into a different project. So we've kind of put our grow stuff aside. But, uh, so my channel right now has a lot of uh, atheist videos. I, I challenge stupid in public. Uh, you know, people that like would run cars into people in Char Charlottesville. I have problems with people like that, and I go out in public and challenge them. So that's what our latest videos are. But we're looking at getting back into uh, our, our our roots, which is, you know, the grow kinds of stuff. We're really excited to be involved in a project, you know, with people that are way smarter than we are uh, with the growing kinds of stuff. You know, we've got some of the lab kind of stuff, but it's an art growing. Uh, so we hope to get back into the stuff. But, yeah, Old Fork Grows is where we are. Uh, you're always welcome to ping us uh, on uh, any of the comments on any of our videos, um, uh, you know, you go into our old stuff. I, I keep track on like one of the YouTube programs to uh, re respond to stuff. You can also get a hold of us at oldfartgrows uh, at gmail.com. However, um, if it's growing questions, you know, there are people on this call right now that run circles around us. But if it's questions about some of the different extract technologies or the chemistry behind those things. Uh, I don't know whether it's good or bad. Our background includes a lot of people that do uh, big pharmacological stuff. We have relatives that oversee clinical trials around the planet, uh, doctors, nurses, researchers, uh, you know, all this kinds of stuff. So, we have a little bit of a different angle. We're, we're happy to help with, you know, some of that stuff. But if it's growing stuff, don't ask us. There are people on this channel that, I mean, just make us look stupid. I mean, point blank. So. <clears throat> well, thank you. We appreciate that. <clears throat> and we, we appreciate you coming in here and sharing all the information that you do, too. I think it, you know, it definitely, it takes a, a group effort and uh, all of us sharing information, you know, helps all of mm -hmm. us in the long run, for sure. A so, rising yeah, those... high floats all boats. <laughs> Super informative about the, the extracting equipment as well. Yeah. Awesome. So um, do you yeah, guys, in, lube too. in terms of that, do you guys have any, um, do you guys have any growing questions? Any, <laughs> anything coming up in the grow room that you are looking to address or? Old part. Oh, uh, grow, growing. Uh, well, before getting into cannabis, I have never kept a plant alive. <laughs> and, we, you know, uh, I, I thought we were doing okay. Uh, we were fortunate to run into Steve in San Diego. We brought some of our flowers I to him. And hey, he hey, said, Pax. hey, you guys are actually doing all right. You know, but... We're not growing ourselves right now. We're more lab think, oriented. Hey, Paps, I think he's asking yes, about what growing method we settled on. Oh, or if you needed help. So basically, um, after doing a, a good bit of looking through um, RDWC, and uh, we also did uh, drain to waste, we did some, uh, yeah, top down drain to waste, and we found uh, using cloth bags to keep a uh, cocoa perlite mixture uh, allowed the roots to come. They'd seek out and they'd hit the edge of the bag and instead of on a plastic pot where they'd start circling one way or the other, yeah, they'd, they'd stop bifurcate. and they'd bifurcate. And right. this is the same technique they use in uh, trees uh, or when, when growing trees. Uh, yeah, fruit trees. To take right. and plant somewhere. Right. So it's and called so air pruning, this, what you're talking it, about. It, it kick starts the root system. And the other thing about the uh, the drain to waste is unlike RDWC, you could keep the the helpful bacteria alive in a medium. You needed a medium for them to sit on. They don't just swim around that well, apparently. In aerobic. And so, yeah. And so, um, the beneficial bacteria is, as uh, we were, as my dad said earlier, some of the uptake stuff 
is like a thousand times better, literally, because of some of these bacteria's help. And aminos, and aminos, yeah. Mm -hmm. One, uh, mm -hmm. one second, uh, Fish Ganja guy's got a bow out. He wants to say bye. Oh. All right, guys, I got to get going. Uh, just finished getting dinner ready, so I will talk to everybody soon. Um, if anyone wants to check out my channel, the link is in the show notes, and you can find me on Instagram at Fish Ganja Guy. And uh, yeah, old um, blah blah blah. Um, <laughs> Tommy and Dorian, thank you for guys for coming in tonight. Uh, Marty, Hog, um, Roger, everybody, thank you. I'll see you guys uh, next week. All right, Take thanks care, for inviting us. Later. Later. Sorry, Dorian, didn't mean to interrupt you. Oh, no trouble. Go ahead. Um, I was just saying. Uh, that uh, having the bacteria alive helps the plants very much because it's a, a symbiotic relationship. Um, uh, in addition to that, uh, something worthy of note is however much... Oh, sorry, I'm getting a little echo. Just give me a second. Okay, uh, however much uh, you want to grow is directly related to the amount of light you have. No matter what growing method you use, no matter what uh, medium you uh, keep your plants in, no matter what nutrients you run past them, doesn't matter. Light is the ultimate limiting factor in how big, how fast, and CO two actually, what not your plants grow. And CO two, so it's very CO2, right. Yeah, yeah, and CO two. Uh, that is that is true. If you have enough light, as to where the plants growing faster than it can soak up CO two, or if and you have a closed in there's ways yeah. to cheat. There's ways to cheat that limit too when you start introducing organically isolated um, plant hormones that you can produce. That uh, uh, yeah, then you can you can push that boundary well past even double the the normal uh, max growth rate. So some of the advanced stuff that we're working with on a commercial scale is that we can't necessarily uh, get into detail on is, is going to be pretty revolutionary. We'll have a lot of cool stuff to share with you guys here before too long. I think next week I'll finally be able to tell you guys a little bit more about what we've been working on. It's looking like so. Groovy. And it costs a lot of money. No, what? To produce that or what? No, for for, for a uh, whole grow project. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah just, for the kind of grow project you're not telling everybody about. Just a few million, yeah. Just a yeah. Few million. <laughs> we'll put it this way: that this grow, if it goes, is is supposed to <laughs> going to be one of the one of the one of the most expensive aquaponic grows in North America. How about that? Yeah, I can't wait to come out there and see it either. Yep. So. We'll have more details on that here in the next few weeks, but uh, hopefully I'll at least be able to tell you guys something next week. I just gotta wait till I get permission. I was hoping before this week, but uh, I, I, everything it might might be till next week. I know I keep saying that, but I gotta just be patient. Paperwork that's why, uh, takes we didn't, time. Yeah, paperwork takes time. Is exactly it. We um, that's why we didn't have last week tonight. Uh, last week in cannabis because I was in business meetings and um, low government local government meetings uh, about permitting and licensing and stuff like that so um, without getting into detail uh, yeah we've been meeting with different uh, groups of people to, to try and get this um, pulled off so well we'll have a hell of a show Monday night yeah um, yeah we'll make up for it I apologize for for skipping out this week I just simply did not have the time <laughs> it came down to that. <laughs> Did you move that to Tuesday nights? Um, I'd love to. Yeah. <laughs> Cause yeah Mondays, especially because like traveling, traveling a lot on, on the weekends or, or traveling right. shortly after teaching all weekend and stuff. Yeah. Uh, I, I teach a lot of the weekends now. And it's like, for me, it's like all day, you know, that's the day I make all my phone calls and do all that shit and get my mind. And, you know, <sighs> Tuesday would be a lot easier to have afternoon to like because we're trying to evolve the show and i really do want to start getting articles uh, uh, uh prepared for myself yeah. to bring up and i need time monday's a terrible day for that tuesday would be much better for me for sure so i love it marty likes that too if marty's gonna be getting in there on tuesday i'm i vote for tuesday too <laughs> <laughs>
also and we might we might also do a, a guest or two here and there on Mondays as well I know uh, what was it Grandmaster level um, growers oh, I love to him. Come on the show yeah so he wants to come on the show but he can't do it because he has his other show on Thursdays so you know we could always talk to him about a Monday or Tuesday night uh, thing and, and and work that out he's gonna be I've been working on uh, trying to get us some cooler guests and I apologize for uh, um, um, uh, we had a couple of weeks there where we were a little light on, on guest stuff a couple of months, you know, maybe a month or two ago. So uh, I'm, I got that all fixed up. We had these, I mean, tonight was one of the most informative things we've ever had, especially in terms of extracts and some of the technologies currently out there and some of the downsides because of the equipment. I mean, that, that was super educational and I didn't know any of that stuff, you know. Uh, I don't know if you guys did, but that was really, really cool. So uh, we're trying to get a lot more cool guests on, such as um, uh, Tommy and Dorian and and we're, we got a uh, bubble man in the queue. We got, um, you know, a, uh, a couple of other, uh, uh, the guys from, um, uh, Hortilux are going to come on the show and we got a whole bunch of, whole bunch of cool guests. I got a short, a uh, couple other people that I can't, we're still working on, on finalizing uh, as well. So <laughs> yep. his and her, his and her grows is going to come on the show here too. So we got a couple of other bigger YouTubers that are, uh, uh, also, uh, uh, have some pretty cool grow channels that we're going to get on the show. So, I got to say Who's something up, about man? Grandmaster level, just just in case you know this winds up on the general tubes. <laughs> he is a badass grower, and he really spent a lot of time understanding flushing, and and he 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 puts points on the board. But please understand that Grandmaster level was a joke. Yes, he's a badass grower, but he is not trying to say he's Grandmaster. He literally started that name on the uh, on the General Hydroponics website when you were putting in what you're trying to understand about nutrients when you're interacting with the General Hydroponics site. There was a level that you put Grandmaster level, and he jokingly started that channel with that name. He's a he's a straight up guy. <laughs> He does not pull any punches. When he makes a mistake, he puts it out there for everybody to see. So please don't be put off by his name like he's trying to say he's all that in a bag of chips. He's he's proper. He's totally proper. Awesome. I understand that completely. That's the kind of the situation I've dealt with most of the time because of being in my position. So, yeah, I understand that. I see people like that, too, that they try to be somebody by using a name, but he just used that when he logged into General Hydroponics. To, to yeah, to yeah, it's just a joke. And like, if you if you know him, if you followed him, he's totally worth following. He's and and he's straight up with the community. I have mad respect for him, really do. Another new friend What's on the me. show called Grow Nerds. I remember he shows me right, something like that. <laughs> Grow Nerds. Yeah, I think so. That I think it's right. Grow Nerds. Something close to that. I don't know. I have it bookmarked. I just forget what the hell the thing is because I'm a couple, one too many dabs in right now on some pretty good rosin. I mean, <laughs> I'm, I'm, glow, I'm glowing some of my moon rocks right now. Actually, here, you guys had a chance to have some of my uh, my bubble rosin. Mm -hmm. You guys haven't had bubble made rosin before. What was You guys have any feedback? Oh, yeah. You guys had that today. I got some, I got some feedback. That stuff that you put in the vape pen. That was just fucking stupid, okay? <laughs> that was just stupid. Holy shit, the cleanliness of it. I mean, I, I've worked with extracts. I've, I've pulled things. There was a delicacy there that, oh my gosh, you don't, you don't get that in other places. It, I could tell that there were lipids uh, and some waxes left in there. Still a little bit, yeah. Yes, yeah, and it's there, and it, it dirties the pipe and everything like that. Fuck that, because the taste <laughs> and the smoothness of it was so incredible. It's like, yeah, you left the dirty pipe. Fuck you. This yeah, is so just you stuck in alcohol for ten minutes. This, yes, okay. it was just there, and and I, I I wanted to chew it. It was so nice. I was I even took a piece of your wax off. I don't know if you noticed. No, you were in the fine. bus. And I took a little piece off and I was chewing it apart in my teeth because I was trying to pick apart what was in there because I'm a chef. And that's <laughs> part of how I do my research is I taste what's in there. 
and I was tasting it and I'm like, okay, it tastes like a plant. And, but it smoked so much beyond a plant. Uh, and, and this is, I'm not an expert like you are or whatever. I've just had to smoke for years and years. What a treat. What an absolute treat. It was awesome. It's the, it's the best, the smoothest stuff I've ever yeah. I've come to. And not only that, it's it's cheap, it's easy. It, it, you can't hurt yourself while making this stuff. Short of dropping the drill in the bubble bu bucket, I think that's about <laughs> the only, and electrocuting yourself is about the only way you can actually hurt yourself. It'd be awesome if there came out an electric uh, press, heated press, that uh, just automatically could go through a, a funnel of of material. material. Yeah. yeah. Let's invent it. Why not? <laughs> I have the website to sell it. So let's do it. <laughs> We're done. There you go. Nobody exactly. tell anybody your secret idea. Yes. Well, yes. I, I got to oh, tell you know, something. This I panel tell you something. Oh. the same shit all the time. It's not, nobody's not thinking the same thing here. Like, you know, and, he, you know, and I'm not, I'll leave it at that. Not, you know, we'll leave it at that. Not really mention anything. <laughs> I know I can't say anything about what Steve's up to, but I got to tell you one of the things I respect about what he's up to is that there's space deliberately designed into all parts of the process that are geared to, okay, let's sit down and talk about the science. And, yeah. and, and, and that he's also going at it from other aspects other than cannabis so that when we say something about the cannabis plant, we can point to this plant, this plant, this whole species line behaves like this. And I've not seen anybody approach this with the mindset of something other than I just want the money. And uh, I, I've been watching what he's been building here. I know he's gonna announce more stuff later, but just as a prequel, he's, uh, He's got his he's got his head in the right place. It's pretty freaking cool. <laughs> yeah, awesome for sure. It's been a couple of years in the making for sure. Even you, even you, I met you about a year ago now. So, and you share with people when they when they help you out, and you share that you share with them equally. That's something that a lot of people and. With that, that start building something like this well, and panels in this group that we're building and you don't share but you know they don't share back they just act like there's, there's so many scumbags and ripoff artists and shitheads in the cannabis yeah. industry and it's nice to be able to put together a group of people that aren't any of those things in the cannabis industry still because it's so rare <laughs> and it's just getting started i think we could all speak on that i know yeah. Well, I've been, yeah. I, you know, I've been lurking on this uh, podcast for about a year now, you know, and I, and I do. I just, you know, I sit back and I watch for a bit and uh, <clears throat> mad, mad respect for, for how you guys interact with the overall community. You know, there's no, oh, we're the, all the bling with the nice artwork sponsorship or whatever. You, you guys just run a boring ass. These are the facts you know, this is what we found out kind of a uh, channel. And I just think it's, it's awesome. Yeah. You know, it's where I go to learn, you know? Yeah, I think we try to keep it to sources. You know, we try to go right, right to the people that make the products or, uh, you know, like we've had, you know, the reps from Mammoth P on when we want to talk about Mammoth P because, you know, why would you have anybody else talk about it? They you know, bring the science, they bring yeah. the science. And, and yep. I see that you, you, you hold that up. I think it's cool. Yeah, that's, that's what's great. Cool. Steve got all. He gets all those people on. So, thanks, Steve. Yes, thanks, Steve. You're the thanks man. Thanks for letting us all be a part of that because there is no. We were talking about this amongst friends the other day. I don't know of any other webcast or podcast that get the owners of companies to come on and talk about stuff and give away science and and, and give you two hours of their time. You know, so it's pretty incredible to be part of this. It really is. He just emails them over and over again. I think that's what it is. No, uh, it depends who it is. I mean, I'll email them or call them. It depends how badly that we want to get them on, or if it's a topic that I think like 
Um, <laughs> Bam for us, Steve, and we appreciate it. Yeah. <laughs> you I go out there and I hike my skirt. They show up, though. And see, the thing is, they show up. And, and I think part of what, what happened, all you have to do is say, look, well, we had just, you've got a list of people now. You've had, you know, owners of major LED, you know, uh, maybe, I don't know how major they are in the industry, so to speak, but they're up and coming and going to be a major player. LED people, you know, Mammoth P, Optic Foliar, you know, getting, again, owners, the owners of the company to come and get on a, a webcast or a podcast like this. You don't see that. I don't know any other shows that are, are getting that that's what i was saying kudos props, to you. props. yeah yeah i mean it's unbelievable yeah. and that's why and i've been trying to take some of the questions that we've even had on the show before as inspiration as to who we should get on for guests i know that um we talked about you know kapow and mammoth p and we've had them on and spectrum king and black dog and i know a lot of people out there and uh, we haven't had anyone in, um that wasn't an LED lighting guy, so that's why I re reached out to Hortilux. And um, you know, if you guys have anyone else on the Sun show you want me to reach out to, let me know. Sun Systems up in Washington, mm -hmm. uh, and and I, if you're going to go anything HID, period, end of story, it's the uh, ceramic metal halide. Yep. those are some badass bulbs. I've tried LED. I've tried double ended. I've tried uh, regular HPS. I've tried regular metal halide. Those uh, the double-ended uh, ceramic metal halides. The difference I saw as a grower, and I suck as a grower compared to everybody here, but the difference I saw, I only ever grew three plants. I've never popped a bean. I am a, a growing robot. My son has so much more experience than I do. It's ridiculous. But just growing those three plants, so science, I only had those three plants. I'm not changing shit. I only had my nutrients changing those lights to ceramic metal halide. What I observed was rather than when I went into flush where the plants would just yellow out, they went through full colors like I was back in New York. You saw the girl doing what she's supposed to do, looking like she would in nature. And so you got beautiful end product. Oh, and the smells. Oh, and the taste was terpene fucking heaven. I'm, I'm, I'm interested in what mm -hmm. Steve's doing with the uh, with the Spectrum King. I want to taste some of that and see how that tastes compared to cer ceramic metal halide. But there's real science on the table. You can research it in Colorado. Um, on They converted a, uh, a big warehouse operation from HPS over to ceramic metal halide. And they got two extra cycles per year out of the warehouse they cut their electric costs below half of what they were doing before switching to ceramic metal halide so I, i'm as i was saying earlier like what steve's doing i love that we're going to be able to just like okay let's get four of those lights put them over here in the corner and and put up or shut up you know i just i like that attitude you know i, I like what you guys uh, represent here yeah, that's cool. I think it has, a, you know, it also goes to the spectrum of the light, too. I think not only the cost wise, like you're talking about, but I think what brings out personally, what I think brings out the quality in, in the spectrum King guys talked about this, too, is when you have that baseline of spectrum that you get from a ceramic metal halide that you don't get in an HPS, which is like, mm -hmm. you know, 95 percent yellow light. Um, you don't you don't get as like hardly any baseline whereas with the ceramic metal halide you get a much broader spectrum um and the same thing with the the higher end leds uh, like the spectrum kings and even even the black dog is going to give you a much better baseline uh than uh than an hps light will and so i've definitely seen a difference too and i have um some cmh conversion bulbs that i got for some old uh metal halide uh, yeah, magnetic convert. ballast and just swapped them out <clears throat> so those okay. lamps were about uh i want to say about 60 bucks shipped to my house and just screwed them right into my uh my metal halide fixture so i went from 400 watts down to 330 watts of ceramic metal halide and the difference was crazy in terms of it was visibly brighter and yet uh, physically cooler like you could tell i mean you could yeah, grab the cooling. yes yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so, great advantage. 
not only so basically you're taking you know that's roughly that 70 watts you're getting similar amount of output and light <clears throat> so that's basically 70 watts of heat i used to run a 70 watt heater in my garage in addition to what i'm getting now most of that consumption was going directly towards heat so mm. i mean it's only going one way or the other right so it's either going uh, in that exchange it's either going towards light or it's going towards heat when it comes out of that reaction so okay. if i'm getting similar light output and consuming less power then essentially all of a good portion of that 70 watt difference that i'm not consuming now from the 400 watt metal halide down to a 330 watt uh, a lot of that is heat so in addition to um the cost savings of not consuming it with the light you're also not cooling your room down that much more with your ac system so that's why i think in a lot of cases even though you're not cutting your wattage in half with just your lights you're seeing more than a 50 percent reduction in consumption because a lot of that is coming from your hvac that you're not running nearly as often mm. as you would have to if your lights were running hotter more consistently does that make sense yeah. yeah, but I yeah, think but a while back you, got, you meant to say that it was less consumption uh, than your HPS, you know, because you you didn't you didn't use you're not comparing two metal halides, right? You're comparing your metal halide to HPS because I'm a minute ago no, you, a ceramic, you're comparing HPS to ceramic metal halide. Right, right. So a minute ago, Marty, you said metal halide, metal halide thing. So right. I was, so I my metal halide fixture, a 400 watt metal halide light. So it's not it's a similar just different so it's a it's not ceramic metal halide so that's what More a lot of your light. Older, older watt lights are More of a light. well, so I, watt I got a oh, go ahead david well that was david if dave's not there i had a question as long as i have such ninjas on on the line what do you guys think about the whole Emerson thing? I, I, I'd love to, if you've done some of that experiment of waking the plants up, putting them to sleep with that 730 nanometer, I think it is, light. Yeah. Uh, that I've read a lot of stuff. I've not had any hands-on experience. Have you guys experimented with that? And, and what do you think it's worth? Spectrum King did a lot, did a whole piece on that, if memory serves me right, on the last episode. They were on a couple episodes ago, yeah? They talk mm. about I'll check that out. Yeah, definitely check that out because they um I haven't done it myself. I've only looked at the stuff they have on their channel and then also Groma <laughs> has some stuff on yes, his channel. Out. Yeah. About it as I like well. Him. I like and, him a lot. Uh, it definitely seems like I mean obviously I haven't dealt with it firsthand, so I have no real like measure other than what I've seen and you can go observe it yourself and check it out. On his channel but uh there definitely seems to be some merit to it but i don't i don't have uh, i don't have the means to test it currently get getting back to what marty was saying about metal halide too for uh, to clarify for some of you folks that don't really understand what we're talking about uh in, in regard to the led spectrums like spectrum king and all where they were talking about a full spectrum light where all the spec, the full, it has a full spectrum light, but it's not like a really heavily red spectrum or anything like that. It's more of a white bluish light that's a full spectrum light and has all the colors, uh, right? In that, yes, that's correct. That clarification for all those people that are coming into the conversation later. Uh, no, 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 no. So the Emerson effect is the Emerson no, effect no, actually. Not the dropped. Emerson effect. Not the Emerson effect. I was going back to when we were discussing metal halides. So, sorry, Steve. It was, he just went back a little bit. That's all. I, I wanted to go because I thought we were done with the Emerson effect. I'm sorry if you wanted to talk about that. I, I, I wanted to clarify to people when Marty was discussing the metal halide spectrum and the uh, LED, the spectrum king ideal spectrum, which was the whiter, whitest blue or purple light with the full spectrum, all the colors, and not a really heavy enhanced red spectrum or anything like that that people are getting carried away on that's the same as what's being mentioned here with metal halides the hps you're saying with all that red spectrum or yellow yellow whatever you say because yeah it is actually yellow they call it red it's red yellow orange but it seems like uh so 
the, the metal house. So it's, I'm just making that analogy and I'll move on. Gotcha. Isn't that true? I mean, isn't that what you were saying? I mean, for, for those people out there that didn't know what Spectrum King meant. Yeah, basically the multicolor ones are inferior to the the broad spectrum ones, and he, he went into great detail as to why. Um, oh, broad spectrum. I'm sorry. Wrong terminology. Thank you, Steve. They're full spectrum. I'm sorry, full spectrum. Well, spectrum it is full spectrum. Full spectrum. spectrum it yeah. is full spectrum, yeah. yeah. Which is more of a whitish blue or purple yep. light. Yep, and there's a lot of hard data to back that up now. Yeah, it seems to be growing every day. I even I mean, fish, ganja I, guy, fish ganja guy just did a what was it three episode fifty one or fifty two, fish ganja guy or fifty whatever it was where we the why reason why Spectrum King was on the last episode, you know his numbers proved it alone. It was two percent higher in CBD, two percent higher in THC. His yields were almost three or four times what it was off the black dog. I mean, it wasn't even a comparable light. I mean, it wasn't even a contest. It was like. Wow. And it's an LED with no movable parts, right? Yeah, yeah, no moving parts. No movable parts. Love, I saw some. I, I saw some of the spectrum things that Steve has hanging today. He showed me what the uh, brand oh, new right. mother's little helper. Yeah, those are over at uh, over at Ouroboros. Should we lost Silver Arm? I was trying to trying to cut to him real quick. I guess he uh, he'll uh, he'll be back again. Uh, yeah, uh, what I loved about that light was you could hit it with a fire hose. <laughs> yep, they have sealed I'm, ones. No, they oh have. Se- yeah, they have. They have uh, a sealed version where you can literally spray it down with a hose. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. To clean them, you know, so you don't. You know, when you're done doing your yield, you spray the lights down too. Wow. Yeah, clean, cleaning your grow space. So many people don't clean, and they wonder why they have cooties. And it's like, clean the fucking house, <laughs> you know. It's ionized water and, yeah. uh, and your gravy. Oh, yeah, we were talking about ionized water, about uh, keeping glass clear so that you're allowing, you know, the photons that you want from the sky to come through. And uh, the cheapest methods, like they use on the car lots. Uh, if if uh, anybody's doing greenhouse, uh, I have a buddy of mine who is a professional glass cleaner. And you would not think so, but people that are totally into cleaning glass know things that we don't. And one of those things is ionized water. And there's a there's a process and some stuff they can put on the glass, like particularly solar panels and the high-rise glass uh, in office buildings that you don't want to put people on the side of them. But the bottom line is, the takeaway message is ionized water will sheet glass off really, really well. So if you're in a greenhouse, that's a great way to clean and uh, keep your costs down. Uh, I don't know what it means for keeping your glass clean inside of a, uh, an indoor grow. I just you know did the Windex like everybody else there. That's a nice little tip. Awesome. Awesome. So I also, one of the other guests I got, uh, we've been talking to is uh, the Super Joint Super Show. If you guys ever watched that on Facebook, it's on Wednesdays at 7 p.m. Uh, I think it's East uh, Mountain Time um, on Facebook. Those guys are pretty cool. Um, they're one of the other guests we got coming up. Sorry, they just sent me a message. I wanted to plug them real quick. Cool. Cool. Yeah, What do they cut? What do they do? What do, well, they have kind what, of a, a funnier, more stoner show. And they have like more of a personality show. It's kind of cool. It's fun. It's still that's, different. That's, that's that's what I was used to when I told you about the old podcast I was involved with on the dopeine.co.uk now. So, so what's right. going on at Everybody's Grow? Uh, what's going on with you, Marty? Just getting ready for this weekend? Do you want to re-mention uh, yeah. that? Did you... Uh, I have one plant that's like, I think it re-vegged a little bit at some point, or um, it was supposed to be one of the ones in my side-by-side that was supposed to be the same strain, and now I'm 99% sure that I fucked up and <laughs> labeled them improperly, so it's no longer a side-by-side. Because one of them, it's like, one of them's obviously shishkari, <laughs> both supposed to be shishkari. Um, 
So, and and the other one clearly is not Shiskaberry, but it's just like complete bush. I don't know if you guys um, are in the cannabis growers group on Facebook, but I posted a picture of it earlier, and it's just like I'm training the plant to the plant at this point, <clears throat> and uh, so I really need to flip it into flowers. So you guys. Uh, yeah, I actually just recorded a video earlier today, and I'll probably upload that to the channel later. You got the rest of you guys will be able to check it out if you're not in the Facebook group. But so it's uh, it really needs to go into flower. So I just just started doing that today, and then um, so we'll we'll definitely be able to cover uh, training to the scrog in class, no problem. We'll have plenty of content for that. Um, <laughs> and uh, other than that, it's just uh, just basically training the net, flipping in the flower. Um, outside, I'm getting uh, some outdoor fruit, though, since I all, all I can grow outside now is uh, food. Can't grow cannabis outside, but I'm getting, like, lemon cucumbers and some mini watermelons and lots of greens. Uh, I've got probably, like, 20 or 30 tomatoes on the vine, so... A lot of the outdoor fruit is starting to come out in the, the raised beds. I got lemon cucumbers and corn and all kinds of stuff like that. Tons of strawberries. So and just go out every day and eat, eat my fill of strawberries at lunchtime. That's nice. So uh, that's probably, I'm probably doing more just like fruit and veggie stuff right now than I am cannabis stuff. Uh, but definitely, like I said, getting ready to flip into flour. So We'll have more more flower content. That's always everybody's favorite, I guess. That's always gets the most views and stuff. <laughs> when you when you got big buds, just veg plants, nobody cares about. So <laughs> I don't film film nearly as often uh, when I'm in veg because it's it's fairly boring. But uh, <laughs> other than that, release some lace wings and some ladybugs. The normal sort of routine I go through right before I start flower. I usually go through my seven day cycle where I do. I'll do an oil spray, then water, then an enzyme spray twice a day uh, for one day. And I do water in between on the days off. So, uh, and I do this every time I go into flower. And it's the same way I treat bugs too, but um, I always do it going into flower just to make sure to wipe everything out. So I go through that seven day process um, and then release the beneficials after my last enzyme spray. Because, uh, whether you're using like, uh, you know, big time exterminator or Nukem or any of those that are enzyme based that um, as soon as they dry, they're not harmful to your beneficial insects. So you can release them right afterwards. But if you're using like Kapow or anything that's oil based and is going to hang around on a plant for a few days, um, you don't want to release your beneficials right away or they can just consume it um, and die just like any of the other bugs. So, or uh, consume it on bugs as well. So they eat a bug that's covered in oil, same thing's going to happen to it. So try not to kill the bugs I pay for. It's kind of <laughs> how I develop this process. So I go through that uh, anytime I go into flower just to kind of clean anything up, anything that's hanging out. And I don't have like a sealed grow room. I mean, my kids going out of there, my cats go in and out of there. So it's not, you know, I'm always just I just, I always have bugs. That's just the way I look at it. Even if I can't see them, I just pretty much count on the fact that they're there and try to control which ones are there. So uh, I just finished going through all, all the spraying and everything and release the beneficials. And then I'll go through with a microscope, check everything out and uh, see uh, um, if I see anything crawling around and I'll start that seven day cycle again. If I, you know, see any bad bugs or anything like that, but that's gotten me through my last two cycles pretty well. So that's kind of uh, what I'm in the middle of right now. And uh, I had to wait for some more beneficial insects to come in that this time of year, it's so busy. The local, my local bug shop um, here is just uh, completely out. Like the only thing they had was ladybugs and uh, I can't remember one other mite that I, I have a pretty healthy population of right now. So not too worried about putting those out. But on Tuesday, I'll get more lace wings and maybe some pirate bugs. I like to mix it up a little bit um, just to try to keep it fun. My kids enjoy checking out the different kinds of bugs. We've got praying mantis. Those are fun, but they take a long time to hatch and pretty late. Uh, pretty late in the game for those. you got to time them just right. Um so yeah, that's what I got going on. It's about, about it.
Mm. Well, I, I, I tell you what, I wish you'd post some of your um, your vegetable stuff in the gardening section over there at ILGO. Got all that mm. stuff harvesting up. That'd be nice to get people interested in uh, that. I think uh, introducing them to the fact that they can grow food as well as cannabis, and you make that realization really helps them get, buy into the concept a little more. Yeah, if you go on my YouTube channel on, uh, I think it's called, I think I called them front porch aquaponics is what I was calling them for a while. And, uh, and there, there's quite a bit of the food stuff on that one. And then um, the backyard aquaponics is the other one. And it's got like elderberries, lemon cucumbers, grapes. Um, so it, what I used to grow cannabis in, so I tried to just replace it with fruiting, fruiting plants. So um, it's definitely uh, still fun, but it's you know really not the same as growing a nice big canopy of cannabis. Yeah, you know, it, it probably produced you know between two and two and a half pounds uh, out of the aquaponic outdoor aquaponic system last year. That was you know obviously really really high quality, and I still have. I mean that's the same stuff that I have right here. You know it's lasted me all year, and. Uh, so it's just disappointing to not have plants out uh, this time of year. It's been a little depressing, to be honest. So uh, <coughs> it, it's bittersweet, I guess, to be in the outdoor ones. I do record videos on them still, and, and probably just not as often as I should. But I, I'll definitely, I, I definitely have some up. You can check out the elderberries and like all that different stuff. And uh, I've just put those cuttings in this year, and I've already got fruit coming out of the elderberry. And I'm, I'm hoping the grapes will be able to put some out this year too. Um, but they probably, you know, in the few months that it's gone from just a, a stick cutting, I don't know if you ever got grapes before, but when you get them as a cutting, it basically just looks like a stick. So it's probably <laughs> growing about eight feet or so. That long about, with roots on it, about that long. Yeah, in about three, three and a half, maybe four months or so. So it, it's been really successful. It's in a dual root zone. So the elderberry, the grape, uh, my son has a dual root zone watermelon uh, plant that he, we basically set up a dual root zone pot <clears throat> and he just planted seeds right inside of it. And uh, he, I think he got three or four of them to pop um, and, and that's all he put in there. So 100% pop rate and uh, there are many watermelons. So they're, they're pretty cool. Um, we've got one ripe one already. It was, you know, about that big or so we've got another three or four of them uh coming out so it's uh it's definitely fun but uh just just wish i could throw some cannabis plants in with it yeah that's sad can what, I, about, can I, can what about I, you silver arm uh, what's new with you oh okay since he's a little more time limited oh no i was gonna ask marty questions you oh, i couldn't hear you Oh, uh, what's new with you and your grows? We haven't had you on for a couple of Oh, not much. No, just, uh, I harvest my, well, I had in my basement and I had troubles with root rot and stuff. My roots were stayed wet, they stayed wet the most, most of the time. So I was doing a, doing a, like a cross with aeroponics, that low pressure aeroponics mixed with um deep water culture. I had like, Almost seven inches of water in the bottom with a lot of um, air diffusers, but uh, it just just had uh, it, they just kept and I had issues. I had uh, they were stressed the whole time, and I had a good product, just didn't have the yield, and I was disappointed with it. But uh, you, I had to try it. Uh, now I'm gonna do some changes right now. I'm trying to do a different changes, different design. I'm think I'm just gonna do aeroponics. I'm not gonna do the deep water culture. And uh, trying my outside with my pond. I had a little pond outside and uh, trying something outside. I I know I started kind of late in the season, but oh well. And um, from that, uh, nothing else that much. I gotta. Something I might be moving to Oregon. I got a business proposition, but uh, it's just not a sure thing. It's just a talk right now. Been there, done that. But uh, we'll see from there. 
should talk to Marty and uh, Pushkanj guy. Yeah. All, most Pushkanj guys moving to Oregon too. I already live here, and I'm still yeah, he here. Yeah. Yeah, I live in Metro. Well, just uh, yeah. south of Metro. Yeah, the three amigos right there. He's moving. Well, uh, yeah, I, I might to the oh, guy you know, If you want to buy a house, yeah. get Marty. <laughs> <laughs> if you're an in, strictly indoor grower and you want to buy a house, email apmeds at gmail.com. I told my realtor we just need to market people that are anti cannabis to be like, look, none of your neighbors can grow pot anywhere close to you. And uh, <laughs> they, they should just, you know, sell it, upsell it to them. I'm sure somebody will pay a lot of money to not have to be guaranteed they can't be next door to any pot. Wow. Outside, anyway. That sucks. Yeah, Why so... Have... No, go ahead. Where are, you, uh, where are you thinking about moving to, Silver? I uh, just right now they're talking about it was uh, Central Oregon. He didn't say specific. It's like a talk right now. We got just drawing some paperwork and drawing plans, floor plans and stuff like that. And uh, I just sure. haven't got that far. And I just haven't had a confirmation. It's just a talk from another guy. And apparently, I don't know, it's a talk so far. Aquaponics or? Yeah, aquaponics indoors. I'm going to go, if I if it goes through, I'm going to go with uh, Spectrum King. I already talked to him, put a, where 20 lights is nice system they got going for me if i put it in the bit you know i let's see the investor goes for it and apparently the investor said yes but i gotta see it on paper first oh yeah how many, just, how many times have we all been promised something uh guys, exactly that's, that's why i said no no that's, awesome. that's like, hey, i want to see it on paper first before i even throw more ideas i say i got everything drawn but that's it yeah, I've drawn up stuff for people in greenhouses, and then they yeah. go, oh, well, I had just come up, and I changed my mind. I'm like, yeah, thank I got 20 hours into this project. Okay, thanks Yeah, exactly. That's what oh, I dude, 20 hours, man. You told me. Well, no, dude, 20, 20 no. hours before 20 breakfast. Hours, Are you dude, kidding? Yeah, dude, that's 20 like. 20 hours before breakfast. <laughs> I'm putting yeah, it not in, like, saying, you know what I mean. hour weeks. <laughs> we know what you mean, Roger. <laughs> Yeah, I've been, yeah. I've been working on it for almost two weeks right now, and I just I just had to say uh, until I get a confirmation, uh, I'm not gonna work no more on it until I see it in paperwork or something, you know. Yeah, I mean, you know, I've talked about it before too in in previous episodes, you know, where I've you know even drawn up had them draw up contracts and had them sent over and yeah. everybody reviewed them and everybody agrees to them and like you know uh everything be in place and literally like the day before i'm supposed to sign that contract you know they just decide that that was not going to happen now obviously that was yeah. right around trump yeah. taking over and all that stuff but you know you never know what's going to happen so until Except, until the names on the dotted line and there's us. money in the bank account, you know, I just <laughs> wouldn't count on it. I wouldn't pack any boxes and stuff them in your garage. No, like I do. <laughs> I do that. no, 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 no. I said no. I said I don't until I see it on paper. I can't believe nothing. It's just a talk. Yeah, and. Uh, and there's definitely people that will use you for information. And even in, yep, exactly. even in that particular case, like they did pay me, you know, some money for the time that I put, probably not nearly as much as the actual time I put into it. And, uh, and, you know, went with somebody else that was, uh, you know, That's hydro, you know, typical nutrient, uh, synthetic grower, um, you know, that I feel like was probably just selling a line, whether it was a line of bullshit or a line of nutrients, or maybe that's the same thing. I don't know. Um, <laughs> uh, either way, you know, obviously, when it comes down to it, they make whatever decision they make. And uh, so until contracts are signed and money's in the bank account, yeah. it ain't happening, in my opinion. Yeah, exactly. 
Well, here's something that I, I find too, and I think this is probably something that, you know, with Steve on his large scale and, you know, all, all the, the higher commercial level, you know, things he's involved in, where, like you said, pumping you for information, you know, that's the thing that I find that, that I've become very wary of is that people contact you and they want to have a talk. And, and, and get answers to their questions. And basically, they don't know anything. And if you answer their questions, yeah, they're off on, on a race to find the cheapest way to do it instead of using you. Uh, or or they want to come and see what you're, you know, like, it's, it's hard for, I, well, this is what I while I'm, was leading it to Steve. Like, say, I grow, you know, I've got a great system I designed myself for a greenhouse, hydroponic greenhouse, drip to waste, a spray to waste system. Well, I had a guy say, well, I want to come over and see it first. But if he comes over and sees it before there's anything on paper, and I got, it's kind of a catch-22 because I actually you want to show your product work. But but then, they, if, you know, if I went and looked at your system, I don't have to ask you anything more, hardly. You know, if I see a system, I can go and build it tomorrow, If I, you know, if I have the money to buy the stuff. Now, there might be – I'll have to you know, I'll have to deal with parameters and all, but you know what I'm saying? What do you think about that, Steve? I mean, how do you handle that aspect of it? I'm sorry. Go ahead. Repeat that. <laughs> um, uh, in in when all right, when, when people contact, we're, we're all talking about how people contact us and how we're all becoming wary of. <clears throat> Of, of, of giving them for you know like they they give they prompt you for information and all you know instead of they want to they come at you like they want to hire you i guess we've lost the momentum of my question because i kind of i was i was he was on a roll for a while and it was basically asking you about how you handle uh people that for instance say all right well what i was just saying uh, make it simple I go into I, I go and tell somebody I want to design a greenhouse. They contact me. They want me to design a greenhouse, but then they either want to come see my operation or they want to ask me all this for all this information on the phone. And um, the problem is, I think if I went to your greenhouse and saw what you were doing, I really wouldn't need you to tell me what you were doing anymore. Now that's not everybody. People, uh, you know, uh, uh, most of this circle, we all probably could do that if you go and see what's going on, because we've all built systems. And once you built the system, it's just a little difference here and there. You got fish, you got to keep them alive, and you got special filters because of the fish, you know, and the, and the waste and all. So it's a, you got that difference in it. But in the end, it's a hydroponic system, you know, attached to right, right. So. Um, I was asking you, how do you get around? Because uh, we got into this topic where we're talking about people taking advantage of our knowledge when they're trying to hire us, or and then they dump our contracts and stuff like that. So oh, how do you get? There's so many fly-by-night people. You just have to force people to sign and pay money in order to actually uh, get further. <laughs> it's that simple. You got to know where to draw the line between giving them enough to know that you know what you're talking about and, um, you know, exactly. Uh, you just want to give them enough. The farm. Just going to give them enough. Just put the worm right there. It's like fishing. Well, see, so right he wants to keep biting, but not enough to for him to steal all your ideas. Well, what yeah. if you know where you, you're you coming know? from? What if the guy asks you, says, but I want to come see your operation so that I, you know, before I let you come over to my greenhouse and, and look at the, you know, thinking about designing, do you tell him no? Oh, yeah. I don't be depends a, on who it is. How much, depends on how much money they're talking. Yeah. I, say, I, tell, I tell them no, because, I mean, what's the point? If 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 guy if, Look, it's not rocket science. I mean, we've turned it into a hell of a science, but it's still not rocket science. It's, you know, chemistry and aquaponics and, and hydroponics and, 
and everything, mediums and the, and the, the, the I love the dual the dual zones, and now we got the new lighting. But it's about it, in a greenhouse situation, you got this guy. If he comes over, if he's an intelligent guy, you know, he basically if he's got any kind of mechanical aptitude at all, he can steal all your ideas and do his own without you know. No, that, that, because the, uh, the secret is the nutrient delivery, the, and then part execution. It yeah. doesn't know your your processes on how you're going about doing this, and yeah. I mean, look at some of the ferment the ferments that Marty and I make. We don't give yeah. out the exact methods and deliberately, you know, on on some of that stuff because it makes a huge difference, you know, and 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 you know, we don't always give out the exact recipes for a secret sauce, you know, because that's how we get paid enough to keep a roof over our head so we can keep doing this show, you know? <laughs> that's a good answer. It's about the execution. Like, I make my own nutrient solution. So unless I teach them how to make the nutrient solution, they can wire a bunch of pipes together, but it doesn't mean they can grow plants. Yeah, it's, or, that's the art. Like, I, I'm so in awe of you guys that actually grow plants because there's so much involved in that. If you if you grow the plant and you give it to me in the lab, what I have to do, yeah, I have to know some math and I, you know, da da da. But it's so easy compared to what you guys do. There's whole bio systems and multiple species lines that you're dealing with, where like in the lab, all I have to know is, oh, I change that two degrees and I get the same exact result every time. Uh, I, the whole time I've been in this growing thing, yet yeah, protect your information, guys. You're totally worth it because when I have something that I can shake through the beakers, there's a huge difference between somebody who can see the plumbing and doesn't know what the fuck's going on than somebody who has no plumbing and can grow a perfect plant every time. That's actually how it I met. shows up in the extraction machine. <laughs> that's it actually really how I'm, that's actually know. that's actually how I met Old Fart Grows. Was at someone's farm who had no fucking idea what they were doing. Yeah, it was it was like <laughs> you couldn't do a reality show and write more wrong scenarios than yep. you could walk <laughs> in ten minutes, and you're just like. Are you fucking kidding me? You're letting <laughs> 15 growers a day with all their cooties walk through the garden? Are you fucking right. insane? <laughs> That's the lesson for those you don't know what he's talking about. You never let anybody walk to your greenhouse from somewhere else because they could bring any kind of virus. I know. Kind of airborne, and I, anything. And I'm nowhere near your, your guys' yeah. level, and even I knew that. And this is how this guy ran his business. I'm like, this is not the real world. <laughs> no, well, yeah, people, people call me up at the greenhouse. They go, "Do you let us call, come and pick our pick pick your fruit?" I said, "No, I don't let anybody walk inside the greenhouse where the fruit is. I, you know, it, it, it could kill it." Go on, brother. Yeah, it was uh, so nice for us. We haven't had a grow in so long. We could actually walk through somebody's grow space and not feel guilty. I mean, it's been like four months since, yeah, four months since we've had plants alive. So you know, we we, we you know we just we're wearing old spice. That's it. We're not carrying mites. <laughs> and it was like Steve was taking us on a tour of a, a greenhouse, and I felt absolutely no guilt because I could not infect it. It was awesome, and that's just from the chemistry side of it thinking you know you come to my greenhouse you got to put on a pair of a pair of fucking uh, plastic shoes and a, and, a, and a jumpsuit and go through i mean go through a shower and, 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 suit. and, oh, and suit. I, rubber shoes. I pay extra for that i pay extra for that are you kidding me? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> you guys yeah, are I got awesome a, i got a i got a shower room yeah you can't come in there unless you get the street clothes off and put them over there Awesome. <laughs> Anything else new with you, Silver? You got any new content? Oh, it looks like you're right, Silver, man. Nick did help me back. No, not really. Just uh, uh, trying to 
do some changes in the basement, but I just got to come out with some ideas and stuff like that. Just And uh, trying to do my outside, figure out for next year. I'm trying to see how this works. Next year, I'm going to make it bigger, have, have some uh, vegetables outside, like how Marty does. Uh, I want to have some vegetables, so, so I can have my kids teach them the whole a aspect of aquaponics, you know, that about vegetables too and other stuff, not just cannabis. Because it, their dad la loves cannabis, but that's not the point. But I want to show them the whole it. aspect of it. Because he has to, not because no. he wants to. <laughs> You'll get there. Don't rush it. No, enjoy yeah, it. a little by little. Yeah, my son loves the whole process of it too. Like his favorite thing about the watermelons he's growing is that he took the seeds out of the watermelon and saved them, nice. and then went yeah. planted them himself. So he gets the nice. he gets the full the full thing, and he saved a bunch of seed. Like that's his new favorite thing is to save seeds from stuff. So we have like seeds from the pumpkins that we grew last year are growing in the backyard right now, and uh, even stuff that he doesn't really like to eat, he'll he'll eat it just to be able to get seeds out of it. So like bell peppers, he's not really crazy about. But if I let him save the seeds out of it, he'll eat it just to be able to save the seeds. So it's the greatest game and reward ever. You're like, okay, I'll let you save the seeds. Just you can eat it. All right. Such a yeah, great life. Like, yeah. I mean, he's gonna grow food the rest of his life now. Now you, now you just gotta teach him to be. A, now you just gotta teach him to be a sous chef. Yeah. Yeah. I'll be be set. Get all the seeds he wants. <laughs> you have the bombest dinners too. Yeah, it'll be uh, you know restaurant quality food too. Oh, I guess he's got to work at a high quality restaurant too. We'll, we'll so you out. build a restaurant and have the grow up. <laughs> yeah, there you go. There's a place in Grand's Pass that has that actually. You can um, they have a big sort of uh, you know it's a, um like farm to table, but like farm to restaurant table, essentially. Yeah, that's my dream. That's that my dream. Like and it's, like, it's really cool. Restaurant. They only get like, uh, like maybe three or four options on their menu. So it's not like they have to provide a lot of variety of stuff and it's all seasonal. Like you can only get it for as long as it's available, right? They don't they'll bring anything in. So whatever is ripe is what is on the menu. And, right. uh, it, it's really good. It's really good. What they pick today is on the menu. Yeah, I don't remember the name of it. I should probably plug them at some point, but, but I don't think there's more than one of them. If you find one in Grand's Pass, that's it. <laughs> we got we got a place down here in San Diego, uh, Del Mar area, actually in La Jolla. It's called Urban Plates, and they're kind of like a franchise setup, but like what you're talking about there, about having just seasonal available dishes. So mm -hmm. they have their staples, you know, their salmon, their chicken, their beef. But the vegetable varieties, you can walk in there. It's like, oh, what's happening today? And it's really just such vibrant food. Uh, but you don't know what you're right going to get, but you always get fed well by eating seasonal like that. Mm -hmm. Right. But we're talking about having actually have a greenhouses out back where you've grown the tomatoes and the cucumbers and the uh, zucchini or you know whatever it is you're serving you know well that's just tits right there that's totally yeah, that's tits my, that's my dream is to have yeah a, the, a, like a bunch of small greenhouses out behind a building where i can wow. serve you know and, and yeah that's that's a, and that's what marty was saying they've got that and that's what they're seasonal they grow the food well i'm sure the pro they don't do the, the grow the protein maybe but they're growing all the vegetables mm -hmm. right um, yep yeah, that's yeah. true. I know they did have, I mean, I know they have some animals on site, but I'm sure they don't have enough to, to meet oh, people all that stuff. Because they do like, like Thanksgiving turkey dinner. We did that one year there at their place. And it was, I, it was really good. And uh, obviously there's only one menu, one thing on the menu there. I mean, you get maybe a couple options, but, you know, it's all very, um, you know, feels all very organic, I guess in terms of it and you can go out and walk through like you can tour the garden they even have like a rose garden you can walk through too it's pretty cool and it, uh, it the i believe the farm itself has been in production for a while and they added on the restaurant um sort of separately so it's kind mm -hmm. of neat that they you know that they have enough production 
it's like they have just enough production in their fruits and vegetables and stuff to to uh, their cost is mainly buying like you were talking about the stuff that they can't grow there locally which is mostly the protein mostly the meat that they source from you know as local as possible uh, we do have fosters here relatively local for uh, for chickens and stuff like that and I know they um, a lot of their dairy products come from the local uh, uh, dairy here so that's that's pretty cool so they do a lot of a lot of stuff like that basically as much as you can I think that's kind of what you're talking about right Rogers basically just as much as you can produce there on site. Yeah, well, I was talking about where you when you ate the salad, there, you, everything in the salad was yeah. grown on yeah. site. And uh, yeah, we might we we might go down and get local fish, you know, like a daily fish or mm -hmm. or like you could have like you said you ate a turkey dinner. So in my yeah. eye, we would go and have a turkey pen built, a nice, uh, big turkey pen, and raise those turkeys all year long until it was Thanksgiving and slaughter them. And you, yeah. so, I don't I don't know if they do that or not. Maybe they do. Yeah, maybe they don't. I'm not sure. It would be cool for sure. Yeah, yeah you could have fish uh, tank. You could actually have. Them. You know, go ahead, brother. I was just going to so, say, have you heard of how a lot of the turkey farmers are having to actually pay to raise turkeys because they're contractually obligated to provide a certain number of turkeys at Thanksgiving, but the price they're contractually obligated to sell them for is so low that it costs more right. to raise the turkeys than they can sell, and they in order to keep their farm legally have to raise the turkeys. So they have to do other jobs just to raise turkeys for Thanksgiving. Well, the sad fact Turkey is that's farming. That is what farming is all about in the United States right now. It costs you more money to grow food than you can sell it for to the stores. Your best bet is to grow it for yourself and go find an open market where you can, there's no middleman and you can get uh, 75 or 80 percent of what you, what you, uh, would get uh, at maybe uh, well you get more than you get like I grow for Whole Foods I could I, I get decent money for Whole Foods but I can get more money if I went set up a stand or bought a spot at a, a, a farmers market and and it's sad that way you there's just no margin they don't want to pay you anything uh, and especially if you're specialized like hydroponics they want to treat you like a conventional grower they want to teach and that's got to change too. Um, yeah, you gotta tell them bite me. Yeah, but the thing is, they don't buy your food then. So you now you grew a bunch of peppers and tomatoes, and nobody's gonna buy them. So you're, you've got to sell it to. You, you can put your own kind of price on it to an extent. <laughs> and in general, the type of greenhouses we run, I was taught when I first started, it cost a dollar per pound to just run the greenhouse. So. You have to, whatever you grow, you have to get at least a dollar a pound. So if you can get anything more than a dollar a pound, then that's supposed to be profit. Unfortunately, the dollar fifty doesn't really cut it for you to live on or, or make any ends meet. You're basically just saving up money to go and, and um, good night, Marty. You're basically saving up money to um, buy supplies and nutrients for next year. And it's sad. It, it's good to see that, that we're getting somewhere. We, we need to do ourselves, even in, in the cannabis industry. And, and it's so nice that Steve gives us a format to talk about vegetables too, and another thing besides aquaponics. Because we need to get the kids, we need to get young people involved early, like Marty's son and, and your son. You know, uh, Silver. I'm talking about all doing all that stuff. You got to get that instilled in the young people today early, because the average age of farmers is in the late 50s to early 60s, and I think that's going to be changing. Because people are getting much more aware, and there's more and more. There's just a spread. It's funny as cannabis production spreads across the nation individually. I feel like all those people will start growing food. I don't know. Anybody got an opinion about that? It makes for better cannabis. <laughs> if nothing else, it makes for better cannabis. And, and I, think better another, I think another part of it is in, in a lot of urban environments, the average person doesn't really get introduced to growing that much. And somebody who's like been removed from that <coughs> and is into it for a different goal finds out how easy it is and goes, you know, I really enjoy good food, might as well. 
Well, I, I think that's just, just more of a, I've got space and I've got, I've got, I just dig it. Once you start getting into hydroponics and aquaponics, you start wanting to build systems and grow more plants. And eventually you just can't grow more pot plants in a lot of instances, or it's illegal, so you grow food, you know. And But I see that I'm finding that uh, we added a gardening section. It's not really, you know, like smoking hot, but it did, has provided a lot of people with a, with a side, you know, looking there on the side, you know, and, 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 and they talk about it and they, and they show different systems they built at home to grow food i think just the idea of they weren't growing anything they start growing cannabis for medical reasons and then all of a sudden they're going tomatoes and stuff to put on their table and they know where the they know how it was grown and how it was fed and it's healthy and so that's one thing roger, i love about roger can i ask you something sure like, I, i've 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 gone through a number of these shows and i'm, I'm aware of your experience and stuff so you have this knowledge and like you were talking earlier about um, is, is a big investor going to deal contractually with me? Is it a better model for you to be a local hands-on expert in that I know what, you know, where, what stores, you know, get whatever and helping people set up their own little environments because you know, I've come from a background of some, you know, marketing kinds of stuff. And I've learned that if you can help somebody make $3, <coughs> they'll gladly pay you a dollar for helping them make $3. And maybe your stability comes more from helping the average day Joe get that six plant plot in their backyard. And it's also providing all the enjoyment of growing food and and like you know other folks were talking about my biggest thing with my kids now is dealing with the seeds and you know that whole family interaction maybe instead of just going the farming side of it with somebody who's going to like pay on a contract maybe we need to be serving more the people who it becomes a lifestyle uh accessory that's is that a good word for it that's my business concept, exactly. Uh, my business concept is not giant. That's Steve's business is doing a giant multi-million dollar thing. I don't have the uh, infrastructure or the legality in my state to do anything like that. But it sounds I, like you could help a lot of people. And right. if you help a lot of people, what I've learned, a couple of those people at least are going to you know, throw you some dollars. Right. So, but the point, what I was getting at, so that's what I'm talking about. When I get to a person that just want, I, and when I say greenhouse, I'm talking about commercial greenhouse, but it could be a 12 by 16 greenhouse. I'm just yeah, saying a greenhouse. Yeah. Basically, you said a grow plot. I would be glad to do a fertigation uh, drip to waste type system, uh, which is an irrigation with fertilizer pumped into the root zone through a uh, tape. Drip mm -hmm. and uh, I, I, set, I try to set people up with that. And again, that's what I'm talking about. If I let them come over and just see it, then they, they could go and do it again. Like uh, it was the, uh, the functionality. I, I of don't it. believe you're saying I'm going to challenge you on that. Please accept the challenge and respect. You know what you know so much. It's a natural fault in, a, in the way we think that you assume other people know what you know. Just seeing the plumbing does not mean you can uh, ride the high wire in the circus. Okay? Right, and you can look this and up. You bring, you bring so much more than the, the actual structure of the plumbing. You bring people, you enable people to use what they saw. If they just see it, that is, I mean, I've killed crazy amounts of shit. You, what, you, what you've got is valuable. Maybe that's the main side rather than worrying about if they see the plumbing. I don't know. I'm just you know stabbing in the I, dark here. I agree with you. I, I That's why I told a couple of people, I said, I could build you an engine, but if you don't know how to, the experience that I bring, the trouble that I learned through my things, I said, you, you might know how to run it, but it's never yeah. going to run right. Yeah. Because I could build it. You could see how I built it. But without the experience, without knowing where to hit when something goes wrong or what to do when uh, something's not going right, you know, something. I said, 
they don't know that. I said, I could make it look easy in the video, but just because I make it look easy, it's not, it's in real life, it's not that easy. Right, <laughs> right. You're no, just that good. good. Yeah, 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 I get it, I get it. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I thank you guys. I appreciate the, you know, kicking in there and trying to build me up tonight on that. Um, you know, but, and I agree with you. I agree with you most, for the most part. I'm just saying it was hard and how does everybody deal with it? You know, it's hard to, to say go, like we were talking about, basically the whole conversation started with, we spend all this time prepping for this customer that dumps us in the end. And how do we get around that was really the original you question. Don't. You don't. It's part of the business. Yeah, it sure is. It sucks. <laughs> It yes, does, it but it's just, it's just how it is. It's just it that is simple. Yeah, and Steve, I didn't mean to cut you off early, my friend. I did not mean to shut you down earlier. I did not, because I know you, yeah, I, I could, well, I've done houses like you're doing what you're doing. I've done takeoff on houses where the takeoff after hurricane repair was $233,000. So I kind of know, and then get turned down after you spent all this time and like visits after visits and trying to close the deal. And so I'm not, a, I, you know, I've never done a million dollar or a multi-million dollar thing, but I do respect everything that I know what you're trying to do. I do. I didn't mean to cut you off earlier on that. So everybody, he's the king of the big ass, big ass growth situation. There. No, I'm not the king, but I'm trying to take a stab at one. <laughs> and we're all behind you, brother. One hundred percent. It'll make more sense here uh, yeah. pretty soon. Yeah, because we're talking in, you know, well, yeah, we're talking about a ghost right now. We've been talking about for months. So. Um, I, I think I, is that, oh, what's new with uh, we haven't heard from Hogmaster. What's new with you this week? And then I, I got to wrap things up because I, I don't want to go much more than ten more minutes because it's getting a little late here. Yeah, so, I'm actually kind of the people I'm staying with. Finished two uh, grows here last week. I got a gorilla glue, uh, gorilla glue done. I got a lemon ice done here this week. I'm hoping to have a ILGM cheese done, a super silver haze done, and a gold leaf done, and a blueberry auto. So, happy times this week for me. Hmm. Where's your house at? <laughs> In the <laughs> middle of nowhere, unfortunately. Dang this, is a, this is an authentic <laughs> blueberry from Amsterdam, a clone from a blueberry from Amsterdam, the original blueberry that was developed by Dutch Passion that came through our network, and I'm sure that is part of our network uh, where we've got, uh, got the genetics and this is a nice blueberry clone. I actually ended up filming mine and it ended up with like 15 colas on it. It's huge. It's almost as big as one of my just female plants there. And it's an auto. I've had very good luck getting three, four ounces off of an auto. Indoor, so nice. Wow, yeah, right now I got that uh, blueberry from DJ Shores, the original blueberry, too. And I'm keeping it, <laughs> <laughs> but that's all that's new with me, man. I had this one flavor that was amazing once, it was blueberry muffins. It really tasted like blueberry muffins, exactly like blueberry muffins. That's a strawberry, that. too. Nice. You said you got a blueberry a DJ Shorts original blueberry. Yeah, I thought, and you said original blue, his original blueberry. Yeah, he has two. He has the true blueberry, and he has the original blueberry. I think that true blueberry I had it before, and it's more of a chocolate tie, and it's, it's awesome. Don't get me wrong, it's good, but it don't have the blueberry taste. Well, blueberry is this original blueberry. Yeah. Excuse me, Roger. A, a blueberry is a, a true indica, really hardcore true indica. Yeah, this one's from DJ Shorts. I you know I ran that true blueberry, and this one is the original blueberry. And 
Okay. And so far, I like how it's going. Well, uh, do, do you yeah. have a do, – can you weigh on this, Steve? Am I right or wrong? I mean, my – but the original blueberry, actual, real, genetic uh, – I don't know. We're from Dutch Passion, invented and 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 by Dutch Passion in Amsterdam. I think so, but I don't the blueberry know. I just showed you was from. Well, I don't know. Robert I don't know. I know Mark Emery back in the day had a couple of good blueberry strains too. That I think that's got he what I heard from Amsterdam Shorts was the one that came out with blueberry. That's what I I, I I'm not for sure 100. percent I'm saying the facts, but that's what I heard from a couple of friends of mine that they're researched it themselves but i can't say for a fact that is true is dutch uh, i got i haven't checked in a long time because i haven't needed to is dutch passion seeds still open because at dutch passion seeds when you go and look at blueberry it says th this is our own personal strain we originated blueberry you know like the original uh, the original think, genetic uh, why don't you why don't you get dutch why don't you get dutch passion seeds on uh i'm gonna see what i can do because in my opinion, the original blueberry was developed by Dutch Passion, which is the cause of Overgrow.com being shut down years ago, 10 years, 10, 11 years ago. They were shut down because they were selling Dutch Passion seed bank seeds in America, just like Mark Emery. We, should, we, we need to get Mark on the show. That's right. You were reminded. We talked about it before. We need to get Mark on he the show. He would be one hell of a guest to get on the show. Uh, yeah. That would be really cool. I, I, in fact, I got to get on that because I, I forgot that I said that he's I did have legal, contact. He's in some legal limbo again, isn't he? I'm not sure, but I did have contact. He his dispensaries and shit, and there, there, yeah, well, he, there's some kind of legal issues again. So, anyway, uh, yeah, that that's interesting though. But my original thing when I first started was I the, my first strain I ever wanted that I read what I really wanted because we wanted to get a pain bed for my wife was we decided on blueberry and we were going to get it from dutch passion but then i started working for a company where i got seeds so um it was one of those kind of deals where because i knew how to grow well it was kind of all at the same time it was all i don't know i just somehow I jumped both feet in and landed and somebody gave me a job you know um but but you know so well we don't have to beat that dead horse you know well but i challenged on that one Dutch Passion invented blueberry. So, dead horses are the easiest horses to beat. Don't worry about it. Uh, and I love horses. I love horses. <laughs> That's why you only beat the dead ones? Yeah. Because right. if you love horses, why beat a live one? <laughs> right. <laughs> All right. Well, Steve, well, Steve wanted to cut the show short, and I went off on another tangent. So. <laughs> What time is it? Midnight? Is it midnight yet? Yeah, like twelve thirty, I think. Yeah, we're, we're, we'll, we'll wrap things up. Uh, got hog, I got a hog master up on the up on the thing here. A uh, little sneak preview of his grow. Oh, he's so putting nice. a nice. Oh, okay. Yeah, he's been he's been doing great. He's he's been at, he's done a bunch of different uh, genetics for my LGM. It's been pretty cool. He even won the butt of the month contest when one month. So, Very cool. yeah, that, that that was something that was real nice of Robert and them to let me do. I started it to to start. I did it for two reasons: to to build a you know interest in the genetics even more than we already had, and uh, and also to get a bunch of pictures of our genetics for identity purposes. You know, so when see people say, "Well, what does it look like, or what does it yield?" Well, now everybody's trying to you know they're competing and they're bragging about their yields, and you know they're showing pictures in their wow. journals and. So we've actually been adding uh, some of the growth journals to as to blog to the blog as uh, articles like a, a blue green grow. Right. So um, what, uh, I wanted to plug Marty real quick. If you guys want to check his content out, he's on AP Meds on YouTube or AP Meds on Patreon. Um, and then I'll let everybody plug themselves, and then uh, I'm gonna plug my class one more time and uh, my channel. We'll get out of here. So I gotta wrap things up. So, um, yeah, how do people find you, uh, uh, you guys, uh, um, everyone? Go ahead. Well, they can find me at uh, Silver Arm at YouTube 32 or at Facebook, uh, Silver Arm Aquaponics. And any questions that could help you, 
Nah, I would try, and that's the only way you could get a hold of me if you want. Very cool. Nice having me, Steve. Anytime, man. I always love having you on the show. Yeah, I want to shoot the shit with you, man. I'm going to try to get a hold of you where we can have a private session sometime. That'd be cool. You know, if you don't mind. You yep. got Yeah, we got some ideas kind of, you know, kind of run together. I'd like to discuss with you. All right. Well, I'm at I love growing marijuana dot com, and I'm, but I'm, 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 I'm so lucky to run one of the greatest forums on the, on the in the world uh, involving cannabis. We've got over 500 articles in our blog, and and uh, we've got some of the best genetics out of Amsterdam on the planet, and uh, we give 100 percent guarantee on all that. Uh, we we've now this past year come up with some great um, nutrients, which I have to say, it's not organic. Uh, well, we do have an organic line, which is very nice. I haven't yet been able to grow with that because I'm in the middle of a whole big um, process of trials. Uh, so I'm using the uh, flower power water soluble nutrient, and I've had the best results with against just about every nutrient I've ever used, including PH3 Park, Dutch Master Advanced, Dutch Master Gold, Botanicare, Fox Farm. And I don't know. There's one I'm leaving out, but this, this, just it's just amazing. Um, without adding anything, that's what I was trying to prove. Can I do nothing but put it in, in pro mix and plant it and grow it? And it's been fantastic. And I'm, I'm I've got got so many people um, together with uh, trying the same kind of experiments on the forum, which is really cool. And and that's all. Sorry, Steve. I go. I know. I go. <laughs> I gotta get rid of. Uh, what about you guys there on the end? Uh, you can find me at ilovegrowingmarijuana.com. Hogmaster. I'm a mentor. I'm willing to help anyone who needs any help with anything. So. Awesome. Sign up and, and see. Uh, and uh, what about, what about uh, you guys, uh, Tommy and Dorian? Oh, us? Yeah. Uh, old we're old fart, fart growers. Uh, <laughs> we're we're more nerd than growers. We really like uh, hanging around here yeah. and listening to real growers. You were guys were tremendous tonight. I'm going to try Absolutely. your vagina cream. I'm going to make that. That was awesome. Yeah, don't tell oh, you. Oh, oh, well, please enjoy. Please, please, we love it when people enjoy. Well, I wanted to say one thing. I know I keep talking, but I, one thing I wanted to say about you guys I mentioned how great the owners of companies that the show is because Steve gets these owners of these companies come on and we get to learn so much that we would never learn otherwise. No other shows do that. And then you guys come on and we. And I'm going to tell you, this is what I got to say. The three or four nights where we didn't have a company guest, we had friends and guys, the shows were just as good. And the information you provided everybody about concentrates and edibles, medibles tonight was fantastic. Thank you so much. The, yes, the innards and the outards of them. I enjoy <laughs> both. There, there's so much involved in this industry. I don't think any of us are ever going to be able to understand it all. You know, like we kind of know our little side of it, but man, we just get amazed at listening to people who really understand the dynamics of growing. Because you're you're the guys that put the best stuff in the lab that we get to extract, and it, it's just really interesting to kind of know the background of that kind of stuff. So yeah, yeah and you got the next generation kind of sitting stuff. next to you. Yeah. You have the next next generation sitting next to you too. So that's oh, as long. He's ten times smarter than I am. I I can't even tell you. Hell, my ten year old's ten times smarter <laughs> than I am, and I don't know what that's saying. We could tell. We could tell. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks everyone for watching. You can check out my channel, The Potent Ponics. Um, you guys can also find the show on Potent Ponics on SoundCloud if you want the audio only version. Um, and then be sure to check out, if you're interested, check out potentponics.com under the, uh, the shop section if you want to check out the online class or check us out down here at Half Moon Bay or Boros Farms this weekend in Half Moon Bay, California, just about a half hour outside of San Francisco. Uh, and that'll be um, uh, uh, August 19th and 20th, 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. each day. And we do have a little uh, 
after hours um, hangout session on uh, yeah. on Saturday night. So, um, you know, if you do come to the class, we do go hang out for a little bit afterwards on Saturday. So, uh, you know, be sure to come out and, uh, and join us if you're in the area. Thanks a lot for watching, everybody. Take care.